ladies and gentlemen, recorded in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. It's time for Fight Night Picks with your host, Frank and Matt Allen. And welcome back. With Fight Night Picks, a big time card coming up this weekend. Top ranked Bantamweights in the main event. Corey Sandhagen taking on Sonya Dung. Welcome, as always, with Fight Night Picks. You can find me, Craig Allen, at Craig Allen FNP, Twitter and Instagram, Matt Allen FNP on the respective socials. That's not his name. Our parents were that rude. They decided to separate that and get rid of the FNP, Matt Allen. But when we look at the card that we have this weekend, I mean, you consider it, there's been big arena shows. We had Paris, we had salt lake city we had you know san diego there are all kinds of big cards but now the ufc is going to lock right in like shania twain or aerosmith with a residency at the ufc's apex we have three straight apex shows and this one is one of those big time bangers and it's a little bit more quantity over quality but i can still get down to bang like julian lane with a lot of these fights because i think for name value wise might not necessarily be there. Fight Night Picks fans are going to be all over this one, like a dog and a bone. But when you do consider it, there are so many fights that we have to cover this week, Matt. It is exciting. Exactly. It's kind of like throwing a handful of darts at a dart board. Eventually, one's going to be a bullseye. One's going to hit that triple 20. You're going to get lucky here and there. And we've got some really nice matchups on this card. I don't know. I'm really excited for Anthony Hernandez versus Marc-Andre Baglio. I think that's a really fun fight between the Canadian who is probably better than the average fight fan thinks, if we're all being completely honest, and Anthony Hernandez, who feels like has had the highest highs and the lowest lows in the UFC. So it's going to be nice to see the more volatile commodity in Anthony Hernandez fight Barrio, who might might have the higher ceiling, even though it is a steadier one. Well, I mean, in your main event, Corey Sandhagen coming off an interim title loss against Piotr Jan, and for Sonya Dong on a tidy little win streak, finished the former title challenger Marlon Marais last time. Out. If I may, because I know you love pointing out the poster when we can, this fight reminds me a lot of when Volkan Ustamir fought uh, Anthony Smith, if I may. It's, and, in, it's in the corner of this room. Yeah, Volkan Ustamir was coming off a title shot, the biggest opportunity of his career, had taken some time off, had a lot of questions that he was trying to to prove and he was giving another fighter a big opportunity. Corey Sandhagen's coming off that exact same situation and now he's in the exact same spot giving Song Yudong a big opportunity in by far the biggest fight of his career and that's the thing about Song Yudong. He was one of those fighters who came into the UFC very early but became everything they said he was going to be and more. So I think this main event's going to be incredible. Song started a team alpha male at the age of 19 Matt again 14 total fights Giga Chikadze out of his co-main event slot with Sadiq Youssef so if anything happens there short notice opponent for Super Sadiq you keep it locked in with fight night picks because that's what we always say but if it does change we'll let you know matt we're gonna throw it on over to our fight of the night screen again where there's so much quantity we got to try and sift through it and pick two you let us know down below in the comment section who you have in the fight of the night screen we'll throw it on over there let us know down below in the comment section who you've got it's time for the fight of the night with fight night picks so our fight of the night screen, we hate to cherry pick off of the main event, but fuck that. It's a giant fight. And listen, you talked about it at the start for Song Yudong for Corey Sandhagen poster fight. The UFC did a hell of a job. And this is actually a really cool yeah. poster, but so is ours, but so is theirs. And in this fight, Matt, a couple of guys that can get it done in the striking, but in very, very different ways. And listen, when you talk about Bantamweight, there's been so many good boxers in this division, but... Sung Yudong's one of them. Like, he really has put together such an impressive resume. 8-1-1 in the UFC in this short tenure. For Corey Sandhagen, likewise, really high-level competition all the way throughout. Trains with a great gym in Colorado. I think this is going to be a great matchup and an absolute barn burner while it lasts. I think these guys have styles that are made for each other. They should bring out the best in each other, and that's what should make this fight so incredible. Sung Yudong has a chance to put himself into title contention in, in one win. And there's a lot of names he can skip if he can beat Corey Sandhagen in an absolutely stacked division. So if Song Yudong could win this fight, I know this sounds weird, but it shaves, what, two years off his career? It really does fast track him towards that title shot. And for Sandhagen... He's been around the top five for a little while now. He was that young upstart who was getting into wild fights in the prelims until he was able to work his way up to main events. He wants to keep this spot. And honestly, Sandhagen made a pretty good account of himself against Piotr Jan. I know he lost that fight, don't get me wrong, but that was an incredible fight between two of the best strikers in the division. So I'm sure Sandhagen thinks, okay, one, maybe two more wins. I can be right back in a similar position. I mean, you consider it. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me Damon Jackson, Pat Sabatini. There's probably some people that are going to go, guys... Why is this a fight of the night when we have big time strikers like Chidi and Joe Kawani, Gregory Rodriguez? 
yeah, I, Gregory's been in a two-round fight of the night against Jung Young Park. I'll give you that. And Chidi and Joe Kwani's won bonus money. And there are a lot of big-time marquee matchups here between strikers. Loma Lukbami's taking on Denise Gomez. D. Gomez, striker, striker, Muay Thai, Muay Thai. But listen, when it comes to the grappling of the mixed martial arts, Damon Jackson, NAIA All-American, he gets it done with his jiu-jitsu. Pat Sabatini, one of the better grapplers we've seen in this division. These two guys can get it done on the mat, and their striking's not that great. I think it's going to be a really good fight. I'm going to zag a bit. I think they both have leveled up striking, if I'm being honest. Pat Sabatini showed the ability to throw some nasty kicks as of late. Had a knockdown with a body kick his last time out, but you are right. These guys' bread and butter are the grappling of it. You didn't think I was going to come here defending Pat Sabatini's striking so adamantly, but still, I'll save more for the uh, prediction video. This should be an incredible fight because these two aren't only good grapplers. They're damaging grapplers, yeah. too. They're going to go for the finish. They're going to go for the submission. We're not just going to see 15 minutes of lay and pray between these two guys. I think we're, we're going to get a lot of scrambles. We're going to get a lot of submission attempts, a lot of ground and pen. Should be a great fight. Should be a great one. Again, 14 total fights to choose from. The comment section is just down below. You put in your fight of the night. We'll try and heart that. We'll try and like it. We'll try and respond to it. Do as best we can. Get that engagement going with the Fight Night Picks community. You folks are great at that. So let us know who you have in the fight of the night. UFC debut. So we get into the housekeeping at the end of the intro. Denise Gomez coming in off of Dana White's Contender Series, taking a fight on short notice, replacing a very talented fighter, but she's taking on Loma Lukbunmi, replacing Diana Balbizia, who that fighter is. If you do look at it, you also have Joe Pfeiffer, Matt's favorite fighter in the world, Week 1 Dana White's Contender Series. Be Joe Pfeiffer. Be Joe Pfeiffer. They're throwing him a ball. They're not even throwing it. They went, here's the tee. The ball's a beach ball. Just hit it. And you'll get a UFC Pretty win. much. That's what they're trying to do. Now, that might not happen. His and then, fight on Contender Series is probably more difficult than this one, if we're being completely honest. Anything can happen. Daniel Zellhuber coming out of Mexico City, Mexico, making UFC debut against Trey Ogden, a guy who got a win on Dana White's looking for a fight and was placed into the UFC. Lost to controversial split decisions yeah. last time out. So, Matt, again... A lot of really good fights. We're talking about some of the ones that are under the radar. If I'm talking about one that I'm really excited about before we get right into it, I mean, Trevin Giles, Lewis Kosey, you talk about guys that need wins. Trevin Giles on a two-fight knockout streak in the L column, and he's on the last fight of his deal. He, you know, put policing aside to be MMA fighter full-time Trevin Giles and dropped down to 170 for the first time in his career's last time out. Really important. Taking fight. on a power puncher in Lewis Kosey that's been out for... Over a year, almost two years, Kosi needs a win here. Trevin Giles needs a win. That's a big time fight, and I think it's going to deliver because of that. It should be a really fun fight. Again, there is a lot of question marks surrounding both of those guys coming into this matchup. I talked about Anthony Hernandez, uh, Mark Andre Barrio a little bit before. I'll give some shine to Tony Gravely and Javid Bashara, too. I think that's a really fun fight, really early on the card, too. So make sure that you're back home with plenty of time. Don't be out getting your pizzas and your pop and whatnot. Make sure you're home watching that. Matt, big time fights coming up on this card at Fight Night Picks Instagram. Instagram and Twitter for all of the latest. Our contender series breakdowns are here on the channel. YouTube's pretty well where it's at for the boys. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's get into it. A fight that's almost a year in the making. Coming up at Lightweight this weekend, we have Iron Nicholas Mata taking on Jumpman Cameron Van Camp. And it was supposed to be both their respective UFC debuts. Cameron Van Camp didn't have the worst nickname I've ever heard in all of MMA. Like, is he a big Future fan? Is he a big Jordan fan? Jumpman? We're going with Jumpman? He didn't have Jumpman before the UFC either. Like, Jumpman? Like, Sean Shirk had Sean the Muscle Shark Shirk, but we he was a UFC champion. We talked about the Pleasure Man last week. You think Jumpman's worse? I think Jumpman's pretty bad. Or, or Logan Clark lost to Anthony Smith on the regional scene as Smith was on the come up. Logan Clark's nickname was the Pink Pounder. You think the Pink Pounder's worse than Jumpman? One's hella aggressive. That's how I'll do. <laughs> and it's not jump, man. No. Tiptoeing in my Jaldens. But Matt, when it does come down to this matchup, we talked about this one a year ago, and then the fight fell out. And both guys kind of had to find their way into the UFC. Now, you probably already knew of Nicholas Mata. He was featured on the Ultimate Fighter Brazil. He lost to Glyco Franca. It's going to happen. He built his way back up. He was on Contender Series. He fought Jim Miller. He got knocked out by Jim Miller. That's tough. And Cameron Van Camp went, okay, well, I'll just do the welterweight thing a little bit more. He came in, he fought Andrea Fialio, got knocked out by Andrea Fialio. So both guys got knocked out in their last two fights. They're going to meet in the middle, but not really the middle, at lightweight. Matt, we talked about this fight a year ago. You know what we're going to do? 
We're going to get rid of all of the bad things and the knockouts, and we'll talk about them. And we'll just give you the straight shine, like that tire shine you spray on your tires that goes away within a day. Well, we're going to get rid of that tire shine very quickly, like the weather. We're going to throw it on back to a prediction we made a year ago, and then update you with those two fights that they had in the UFC. The odds will make a final preview and prediction. Neat fight coming up on short notice this weekend. We have the UFC debut for a couple of fighters in Iron Nicholas Mata taking on Lebanon, Indiana's Cameron Van Camp. And for Cameron Van Camp, it's kind of like he's a flying Walenda. He's not the only brother that's a fighter. He has two other brothers that are pro MMA fighters. He's a guy that kind of picked up the trade when he was in his senior year of high school and he hasn't looked back. A total record of 15, 5, and 1. And some fights against some guys that you would recognize. A loss on his record, Austin Hubbard. He fought Bobby Volker at one point, 2019. How crazy is that? He beat. Matt, I mean, who can we pick out that, that's a really impactful win on here? Dan Stitkin, that people might recognize. He beat Quentin Parks Jr. twice. He has a no contest on his record against Thomas Gifford, and he ended up losing by submission in the first minute. But Gifford, you know, going to Gifford, and it ended up as a no contest at the end of the day. But for Cameron Van Camp, he's a guy that switches things up on the feet. He'll start out orthodox. He'll switch over southpaw, throw a couple jabs out there. Go back over to Orthodox, but really what he does very well in his fights, he's just so tricky to try and figure out whether he's working in his grappling, whether he's working a flying knee to end up into the clinch to get you down and then submit you. Like He can get it done in a lot of different ways. In this fight, though, he's going to be taking on a Nicholas Mata that's one of the more dynamic strikers that you're going to find outside of the UFC. This is a former CFFC champ. He earned a shot in the UFC with a win in 2020 on Contender Series over Joseph Lowry. He was booked to take on Demir Hodzovic earlier on this year. He got hurt. He was supposed to take on Jim Miller this weekend. Miller dealing with some COVID complications. So ultimately we get this fight. But if you know Nicholas Mata, there's a reason why he was booked against those high value names. His losses on his record, Robert Hale, Antonio Carlos Ribeiro, he lost to Glyco Frasa on, uh, what was it? The Ultimate Fighter Brazil Season 4. Got finished in that fight, but Frasa would end up winning the season. And then before that, or in the middle of all of this, he knocked out Joe Selecki in 2018. That's a pretty big win. I think that's why you'd see Mata matched up with Ahadzevic that's been in the OC for a long time, who ended up fighting a really tricky out in, who was it? No longer in the UFC, uh. Nancy Medeiros. Or against a guy like Jim Miller that has that big time name value. That was a big stepping stone for Joe Selecki. Would have been an opportunity for Mata. Now Mata draws Van Camp, who's got to try and make the weight on really short notice too. His last fight for Van Camp, that is, in 2021, back in uh, July, he fought at welterweight against Kenny Gaudreau. Finished him in the first round. Before that, he fought Haraz Sion. That was at 170 pounds, but his opponent, Sion, was not 170 pounder. He's a little guy. So this is going to be tricky. Van Camp has a lot in terms of reach and height in this fight. So what do you say here? Cameron Van Camp reminds me a little bit of Kevin Lee. And I understand Kevin Lee might go for a lot more takedowns, but their games are somewhat similar. And hear me out. They both do switch stances, like you had mentioned, but Cameron Van Camp has a very, I guess, signature trait that I don't like. When he switches stances, he's kind of hittable when he does it. And He's not one of these fighters who knows his own skill set to the level that I'd like. Like, Cameron Van Camp to me strikes a little bit too much, honestly. I would like to see him go more just hardcore, like, I'm going for more takedowns now. Because when you watch his fights and when he does have his most successes, when I when he is mixing in the takedown with his striking, when he's keeping his opponent guessing is when he is at his best. And it's interesting. Cameron Van Camp switches his stances based on his opponent's stance to make his single leg takedowns easier. If you are standing at him uh, orthodox, then he will match you, I guess it would be southpaw, so that his right hand is closer down to your leg. It's just, those are those like weird veteran things that you don't normally see from fighters making their UFC debuts, but just something I picked up on, something that I thought was kind of cool. Nicholas Mata has legit striking though in both hands, and I don't, I should, uh, 
I don't just want to say that he has good power in both hands. That power translates to his kicks too, and he is somebody who will finish his combinations with kicks. He's not at like Oscar Payotta level of it, where it's like, oh, you do this every single time and you don't have another trick, but he does really like to incorporate his kicks into his striking game, and this should be a really interesting fight, because I could see Mata having two different versions of his UFC career. I could see him having like a Lando Venata type start to where it's, you get this highlight reel knockout, then we throw you into the deep end of the pool and you have a fun career but maybe you don't ever reach the heights that were once uh attached to you or monica go out there have tough competitive fights and actually develop into a really top tier talent one day i wouldn't be surprised if that was the case either for the guy cameron van camp his last time out at 155 pounds was back in what was it april of 2018 against thomas gifford where he got submitted in the first round for nicholas mata again Former CFFC champ, it should be said too for Cameron Van Camp. I made the joke about his brothers are MMA fighters and that's cool. His last four fights with different organizations. B2 Fighting Series, SHP, Chosen Few, United Combat League. He won a belt for four different organizations before making the switch to the UFC. They needed a guy on short notice, they got him. Alright, so Matt... Now you know about Nicholas Mata and Cameron Van Camp in the best of light. Everybody thinks so highly oh of them goodness. now. Future contenders. Now we're going to get back into the nitty gritty and what actually happened. So for Cameron Van Camp, he got performance of the nighted against Andrea Fiel. You got knocked out by him. But I will say this. Before Cameron... Everybody's going to forget about this. Clipped him a couple times. Before Cameron Van Camp lost Andrea Fialyu, he rocked him with a right cross. He was throwing really good leg kicks and he was throwing great tee kicks to the body. He was winning that round... Until he finally got clipped, got caught by a right hook, and then a right straight dropped him, and that was pretty much all she wrote. But Cameron Van Camp, it's one of those performances in a loss round. Hey, you know what? I know he took on a bad level of competition. I know he won in his seven fights before coming into the OC. His last seven wins, they were all championship fights with completely different organizations. So that's pretty cool. A lot of hardware. You don't have enough arms. He probably looks like a boxer, like winning a whole bunch of titles. What do I do with all of these things? Demetrius Johnson would have an answer, but the UFC didn't give him those titles back. So you're just talking in circles at this point. For Cameron Van Camp, Matt, we gained a little bit of stock or a little bit of knowledge in a lost Andrea Fialio, but you still got knocked out in the first round. And now... I have no idea how he's going to make 155 pounds with his frame. He is going to be one of the bigger fighters in this weight division. But the thing is, if he is able to successfully make weight in the class, uh, he should be able to fit in. That's the thing. Like, there are big benefits when you do cut a lot of weight. There's a lot of negatives, too. Don't get me wrong. But let's say his durability isn't affected. And that is a big if. Because, he again, he just got knocked out to 170. I guess a pretty big power puncher, to be fair. But let's say his durability is affected while he's cutting that extra 15 pounds. He could be more brittle at this weight class. And if he does get into a firefight with Nicholas Mata, I could see him being on the losing end of it, just being clipped by sort of a wayward shot, if you will, in the middle of an exchange. But I do like the long-range attacks out of Cameron Van Camp. And, again... It's hard to say that he proved that in his UFC debut, but it's sort of what you would mention. I know he got knocked out in the first round, but there were some positive signs in there before the loss. Well, if you look at it for Van Camp, this is going to be his first fight at lightweight since 2017. He lost a very, very quick fight by guillotine in the first round to Thomas Gifford. And the fight was overturned to a no contest. Name. Gifford tested positive for something. They just don't really say what the something was. So... The commission tested positive. It's a no contest on Van Camp's record, but he did lose that fight. Matt, for Nicholas Mata, I mean, if you did watch that original prediction, we gave him a lot of shine. And then in his fight against Jim Miller, we gave him a lot of shine. And Mata was about a 2-1 to one favorite against Jim Miller. And he came out flat from the very start of that fight. Could not respond whatsoever to the leg kicks of Miller. Because Mata is a typical boxer that waits, 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 unleashes with his big combination, throws with a lot of power. He has very fast hands, but he's really heavy on his lead leg, and he's got nothing. He's not Nate Diaz. He is not Nate Diaz. So for Mata, really low volume, no big blitzes in the power. He can get behind on those volume numbers. You saw that on Contender Series. Because he can beat the hell of it as his opponents with his power and his combination. So it's going to all depend on whether or not Mata's back in with that championship mindset. And the other thing with Mata, I got a lot of shine for him. He's trained at Novo and Yao. He's trained at Factory X. Now he's at Extreme Couture. He switched around to a lot of these big power gyms. It's more of a question mark of what am I going to get out of Nicholas Mata than it really is for me as to what I'm going to get out of Van Camp. I think we are going to get a better version than we saw in his UFC debut. He fought one of the more wily veterans that there are out there and Jim Miller, who's been around the block, fought every style of fighter in every manner of fight. So I do think Mata is going to be a much better version of himself against Cameron Van Camp. Again, 
I think there's levels to this game, as there are, and Jim Miller, I think, is on another level. I know that's weird to say where Jim Miller is in his career, but still, even this older Jim Miller has been a very effective fighter at the stage of his career, so for Mata, I do like his power shots, especially if he is able to get on the inside of the range of Van Camp, and I do think he'll be able to do that. That's the thing about Van Camp. He is good with the long range, but if someone does get on the inside, he's not like a Brian Ortega, the fighter that I normally use. Someone who can immediately go to the elbow to sort of work out a middle range, if you will. Okay, I can grapple if you're really close. I can box you if you're far away. Now I have the elbows to deal with you if you are in that clinch range. I think Mata can have similar success in some of those similar ranges in this matchup. And I, those long range attacks of Cameron Van Camp, if you really like him in the smile, matchup we'll see how it plays out because for Nicholas Mata again overarching theme and I'm going to talk about it in a few of these fights this weekend these fights are at the apex Nicholas Mata this is his third fight at the apex Dana White's contender series 2020 his fight against Jim Miller was at the apex as well and you'll see fight night Walker versus Hill and this fight as well so a little bit of a, a comfortability if we're going to use that word with that smaller cage but for Van Camp when you're fighting with a lot of those regional promotions they also use small cages. So a big guy that understands his frame in the small cage, you love to see it. We look at the odds here. Mata is a pretty big favorite. Open minus 230, minus 235. So you got to play with a little bit of chalk if you're going for Mata. For Van Camp, open plus 195, plus 190 right now. If we have a look at the topology votes, Matt, surprise to us there to you. And I say that, like a lot of chalk on Mata. I feel like the fans are going to go with them, but I don't know by how much. I'm going to say over under... 70% Mata. I'll say under. You're going to say under, and it's slightly under. So 802 total votes, 64% Mata, 52% by decision, 50% by knockout. For the 30 per six, 36% that I have in camp, 32% decision, 29% submission, 30% by knockout. Matt, when we do look at this matchup again, Van Camp, more depth with the submissions. He, he very much is submission over position if he does get it down to the mat. For Mata, I mean, you see it in the nickname. He boxes. And that's, he does. That's pretty much that. So when it does come down to this matchup, Matt... Who are you going with as far as a pick? I do like Mata. I think he can keep this fight in the ranges he needs to keep it into when I do like him with his boxing a little bit more than I like Cameron Van Camp's stand-up. And that's why I do favor Mata to win this one. But I'm not a big fan of the odds like you had mentioned. No, for Van Camp, I love the size. I love the kicks to keep the boxer away that he uses. Leg kicks, kicks to the body. He will mix in the head kick here and there. But when you do look at it for Van Camp, I don't know what he's going to look like at 155. That's what I mean. I think this, the size is a detriment. This this is the Friday at weigh-ins day to get you set up for question mark kick so i also like nicholas mata love the power love the fury love the combinations i have to see them i didn't see them at all against jim miller and he's a big favorite and i picked him to win in that fight he's about the same favorite in this matchup as well both of us going with brazil's mata but let us know who you have down in the comment section is it jump man cameron van camp is it iron nicholas mata some big fights on this card a marquee banger at 135 pounds in the main event between song yadong and Corey sandhag let's keep it locked in with fight night picks we always say let's get into it And coming up this week, the snow leopard, Javid Basharat, looking to make it a big week for his family. Brother Frid trying to prove himself on Dana White's Contender Series this Tuesday. So if you're watching it before then, they could go 2-0. If you're watching it after then, who knows what already happened. But when it does come to this matchup, a giant step up in competition. If you look at it for Basharat, he faces Trevin Jones in his UFC debut. Jones just could never get a fight. Basharat goes in there, and man, did he ever look good in that fight. And he's taking on a guy in Tony Gravely. 4-2 in his UFC tenure, former champion with King of the Cage, former champion with CES. Tony Gravely's been there and done that against some really good competition as an amateur, as a pro. And that's kind of the craziest part about Gravely if you want to go through it. My one knock on Javid Basharat before he fought Trevin Jones was, geez, I don't know. He hasn't really fought the highest level of competition, this, that, and the other. You look at it for Tony Gravely. He's fought the highest level of competition all the way up through a loss and a win over Damon Blackshear is now in the UFC as an amateur. And then as a pro, you go all the way up through it. Losses to Pat Sabatini, Ricky Bondejas, Marab uh Manny Bermudez. He had a fight against Patchy Mix. He had a win over Draco Rodriguez, Chris Moutinho, Ray Rodriguez on Contender Series. And then in the UFC, for Gravely, a fight of the night and a loss to Brett Johns. He also has a performance bonus win over Anthony Burchak. Finish wins over Burchak and Johnny Munoz Jr., which was Gravely's last fight back in June. Matt, when we do look at this matchup, pretty well buried on the prelims, but these are two really high-level bantamweights, and I think this is a very, very big fight coming up this week. It weekend. should be a very exciting one, too, and a high-level fight, because the good thing about Tony Gravely is 
He's kind of the perfect fighter to give somebody making their UFC debut. If they beat him, they're going to be a really good fighter. And if they don't beat him, then we'll see what happens. Because for grappling, you just know what his game's about. You kind of know the foundation, you know the bare bones of it. He is a very strong wrestler, even though if you're a great submission artist, you can kind of capitalize on some of his wrestling. He is a very heavy-handed striker, but if you're very technical on the feet, you can find some of the holes in his games. And that's what's so fun about grappling. You know what he does well? It's a very strength-oriented game. He does hit very hard, like I had mentioned. And that's the thing about grappling, too. It'll be really interesting. It's almost like he has to figure out what the best fighting game plan is for him. And it's wild how experienced he is to be this far into his career. But some fights will come out and wrestle very heavily for the first round. Some fights will come out and he'll try to box a little bit more and become a bit more of a striker. It's always very interesting for me to see what version of Gravely we get. Because the best version is the one who can mix both together. And become the fighter I always mention when I talk about this. The Chad Mendez. Make people think about your takedowns to then open up your power shots. Because that's the only knock I have on Gravely's style is he doesn't have a great range finding weapon to really close that distance other than the threat of his wrestling now with the threat of his wrestling he can land some of those overhand shots uh but I think on the outside, the movement of boss shots can be really tough if Gravely's not able to establish either a clinch control early or something like a leg kick, a body kick, a jab, just something to keep the range in between them the whole time. Well, and a couple of things, I mean, I tried to do my best with that graphic just to show off slightly the height difference because Jivid Boshrat will have a significant height difference, but range-wise, they're both the same. Now, when it comes to the movement on the feet, Tony Gravely going to plod forward. He will cut the cage a little bit, but if you look at it for Javid Bashra, some really, really technical footwork, and you can see that on display when he was fighting on the regional scene. Beating guys that he should have beat in a multitude of ways, and that's the big thing. Plenty of finish wins by submission, by knockout, but if you look at it, his first decision win was actually his last time out, so that was kind of crazy, and for Bashra in that fight against Trevin Jones, we said it in the original video, Trevin Jones is going to show up and do one of two things. He's going to throw decent volume, mix in his power, and show off his wrestling, or he's going to do none of that. He ate a bunch of flying knees. He ate a ton of punishment, and every time that Jones went for a takedown, it wasn't a double up against the cage. It was almost like, hey, I'm going to try and leave my head up, leave my arm out, go for a single leg, and Javid was able to stuff all of the takedowns and really make him pay when it was on the feet. For Tony Gravely, I mean, you talked about it. He kind of struggles finding the range, but usually he's a smaller fighter. He doesn't have much in terms of reach. He's got to kind of just throw those hammers out there to close the distance, going for a power double leg. National, uh, you know, uh, NCAA D1 trained wrestler at Appalachian State, you know, the team that uh, completely upset Texas A&M last weekend. A huge win over there for App State. But for Tony Gravely, I look at it in terms of the X's and O's. And it is a lot of power shots. Sometimes he comes out and he's willing to strike. I think it just depends on the matchup. He comes out of ATT proper. Used to always be out of ATT Atlanta. But Pahumpa Marcus Damata is his main uh, coach over there. You look at the guys that he's training with. I mean, Kyoji Horiguchi in the smaller weight class. As well as Alessandre Pantoja for this matchup in specific. And if you look at it for Gravely in terms of the all-time Bantamweight stats, first all-time in Bantamweight history with top control percentage, uh, he's four knockdowns so far in his UFC career. That's tied for seventh all-time in that category. But the biggest one for him, tied for fourth with the most takedowns ever in Bantamweight history, tied with Dominic Cruz and Ronnie Ayala with 28. So, listen, Tony Gravely going to go for a lot of takedowns in most of his matchups. And in a matchup against a more polished striker and a guy like Javid Bashrat, I would expect the takedowns to be early out of Gravely. Oh, he's going to need them. I don't think Gravely can strike with Bashrat at all in this fight, if I'm being completely honest. No. Again, the lack of a range finder is going to open him up a lot. And if he does try to swing big power hooks into his takedown attempts, that's going to leave his head wild, or just like, extremely exposed. And if Bashrat's able to land clean, he's going to hurt you. I know he didn't knock out Trevin Jones' last fight, but he hurt him a lot. Oh, yeah. Like, a lot, a lot. He Busted hurt him. him up. Every time he landed a clean power shot, it would hurt him and have a real effect on him. And I do think that would have the same effect on a guy like Tony Gravely. This is my only thing with Gravely. Yes, his stats are good. Yes, his takedown numbers are good. He hasn't fought another high-level round. Like, Dominic Cruz has only fought some of the greatest fighters of all time in Bantamweight's history. He fought Brett Johns in a fight of the night. That was his UFC debut on short. No, like, Brett Johns is a good fighter, but Brett Johns is now in Bellator. Like, for Gravely... Because he got the bag off a win. Gravely has been around for a long time, and he has a good record in the UFC. At this point, you would expect him to be fighting people who aren't just coming off making their debut. That's all. I thought Gravely would be fighting borderline top 15 talent by this point. 
Like, yeah, I, I just I, I think Bradley's a really good fighter. I just expected it by this point of his career. He would be fighting those fighters. It's just, this fight is so unique because it's the technique of Boshrat, if he is able to land one of those clean counter shots on the in-between, really make Gravely pay for uh, some of the advancements. Or Gravely's going to get a hold of him and, like, early career Yoel Romero him. Just look really good with his wrestling. Rinse and repeat over and over again. And if you do look at it for Boshrat, completely switching things over in the last year, going to Extreme Couture, and that's the perfect camp to get ready for somebody like Tony Gravely. So when it does come down to the odds in this matchup, Gravely opened a plus 185 or thereabouts. He's still a pretty big favorite, and it's actually ballooned, or sorry, a big underdog, and it's ballooned even further. Boshrat open there, and I mean, minus 163 for Boshrat, plus 155 for Gravely. So Boshrat, decent favorite. Second fight in the UFC against a guy like Gravely. That says a lot about the type of fighter that Javid Boshrat is, and man, our Fight Night Picks fans. Also fans of Javid Bashra. We have a look at the topology votes, Matt. Surprise to us, they are to you. But I do think on topology, there's going to be a carryover. I think for Javid Bashra, I'm going to set the over under at 67.5%. What would you say? I think it'll be over. You think it's going to be over? And it is over. So 781 total votes, 76% Bashra, 60% by decision, 23% by knockout, 11% by knockout. Uh, for the 24% that have Gravely, 54% by decision, 34% by submission. I think I butchered that. 23% by submission for Boshrod, 11% by knockout. Matt, you kind of talked about it. I mean, if Gravely can't figure out the takedowns early, can't get the range, it's all Boshrod's fight. Are you setting it up for a Boshrod win? Uh, hey, this is a really hard fight to predict. I am going to ever so slightly favor Boshra, but it's weird. I don't agree with how the topology votes break it down. I know he has a lot of submission wins, but a lot of those are set up by his strikes. And I don't think he's going to hurt Gravely and then look to just jump into a big uh, elongated grappling exchange. I think he's going to look to pick his shots afterwards. Almost fight like a Jeff Neal if he hurts Gravely. Let him back up to his feet, be technical, try to pick your single shots. Again, Gravely could win 14 and a half minutes of this fight based on his wrestling and grappling alone. But the fact that he has been finished multiple times before. I know a lot by submission, but still, we have seen his chin get checked. And the fact that Bashra is such a clean striker, again, I'm ever so slightly going to favor the Snow Leopard. And Javid Bashra has been training a lot with a guy who can really get it done on the mat in the Prince Amir al -Bazi, another really good guy to have for a matchup like this. But I like Gravely's takedowns. I like his ground game. And I like his control once he gets guys down to the mat. It just depends. Can he get him down to the mat? So you said... It's a really close fight. I agree. I'll go with the underdog in this matchup for that reason. In Tony Gravely, I think it's a decent price for a guy with that much experience. So we're split on the pick. Matt going with the Snow Leopard, Javid Boshrat. I'm going to go with a man of no fixed nickname. Tony Gravely to get the win. Let us know down below in the comments section who you have in this matchup. And I know that you will because this is a very, very competitive one at the start of the prelims. A big time fight in the main event in the same weight class. Corey Sandhagen taking on Song Yudong. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks as we always say. Let's get in. Do it. Coming up this weekend at the women's flyweight division, we have a matchup between Maria Agapova, Demon Slayer, taking on Jillian the Savage Roberts. And Matt, a lot of people might not know, but there pretty much is a built-in rivalry in this matchup because both of these ladies used to train at American Top Team proper. Now, Maria Gapova trains at American Top Team Sunrise. Jillian Robertson trains at the Goat Shed. That's kind of the reason why she's been away for a little bit. Listen to an interview that she did with James Lynch of MMA Sucka for this one. She did back August 16th, and she kind of touched on that point. That was why she was away. Originally, this fight was supposed to be Melissa Gatto versus Robertson. Gatto's out in steps of Gapova, but there has been some notice for this matchup. So again, both these women have trained before, Matt. I think this is time to break it out. You know there's going to be some bad blood, but I, I don't have the, the Taylor Swift one. So I have the Ryan Adams cover, 1989, the vinyl. You like that one, Mac? You like the Ryan Adams version that he did of all the covers of the Taylor Swift songs? I did enough that I decided to buy it. But there will be some bad blood in this matchup. And when it does come down to it, Maria Gopova can be a very, very aggressive grappler when it suits her. When it does not suit her... Oh boy, does boxer Marina Moroz have a lot going for her. But the problem is, Jillian Robertson is cut from that cloth. I would love to believe that Jillian Robertson is a great all-around grappler. But in the UFC, she really hasn't shown that ability, if we are being completely honest. She's a great offensive grappler. When she's the one being able to dictate the terms under which uh, she's grappling in a fight, she will have a lot of success. And I thought she would have similar levels of success, no matter what position she was in on the mat, too. It didn't yeah. just have to be off that top control. She'd be able to work her way out from her back, get back up to her feet, and then dominate with her own wrestling again. 
But Jillian Robertson is somewhat heavy on her back. It's like wrestlers are kind of like a tortoise. Like if you flip them on their back, they kind of become helpless. And that's because when you're a wrestler, well, you don't really train to be on your back that much. The sport normally ends the second you do. So you just get back up and keep on scrambling. With Robertson, that has been an issue for her. And we're going to talk about this a lot more when uh, Aspen Ladd fights Sarah McMahon. Because Sarah McMahon is pretty much the poster child for this. But for Robertson, I really do like her wrestling in this fight. And I really hope she does try to use that part of her game. Because for Agapova, she is the more volatile striker. I do think she has more power on the feet. She does have very erratic movements from time to time on the feet. But Robertson just plods forward. And unless Jillian Robertson's been able to add some large new wrinkle to her game that I have not been able to foresee whatsoever, I think she's always going to struggle against anybody who is in the borderline rankings because that's the thing about Robertson she's been around for a while now like she fought Molly McCann all the way back when Jorge Masvidal fought Darren Till that was a long like back before fight, back before it was cool to beat Molly McCann no 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 you have to understand though that fight was fresh off the Demetrius Johnson Ben Askren trade we were doing trades in MMA it was so long ago and she's still fighting people who, if we're being honest, are still somewhat around that entry level of fighters. I know Agapova's been around for a little while, but you don't really expect her to beat a lot of fighters who have had five, six, seven fights in the organization. Well, the, the, that's the really weird thing. So Jillian Robertson came in off the Ultimate Fighter season 26. She's 7 of 5 in the UFC. Like, she, in terms of, of all-time women's flyweight, you know metrics and it, the, the division hasn't been around for very long but she's tied for number one all time with the most fights in this division with 12 caitlin chukagan is the one that she's tied with she's number one with finishes and submission wins she's got six finishes and five submission wins so you listen to the interviews and you read the stories about those interviews jillian robertson wants to take her down in this fight jillian robertson has two brothers that fight with combate that are great training partners to work her grappling and to work her wrestling and if you look at these it. two in terms of their styles when Robertson wins, she's taking these women down and she's submitting them. Look at her fight against Priscilla Cachueta. That's a very good example. When Maria Agapova is winning, she's taking fighters down, finishing them, or utilizing really good striking. But, but, when Maria Agapova is struggling with the takedowns, well, look at her fight. Shanna Dobson, she went way too hard in the first round, didn't have anything in the second round, gets finished on the ground. Her fight against Marina Rose. Well, Marina Rose is the poster child for pop, pop. Pop, pop. She did an arm bar Joanne pop, pop. Calderwood way back in the day. That's true, and that was way back in the day, but you're right. I don't know how I remember but that. But in that but... matchup against Agapova, Moroz just went straight for the takedown, hold her up against the cage, get her down, and, and Moroz had a great first round, and then in the second round, got her down. You talk about wrestlers struggling off their back. Moroz got her in a triangle choke, and Agapova couldn't do anything off her back once she even got close to that position. But on the flip side, you can't forget about the two Agapova wins. And I realize level competition is what it is. But both of her wins that she has in the UFC, the first one over Hannah Cyphers, the second one over Sabina Mazo, are both performance bonus winning fights. So that's kind of the, the, the one for Agapova. Is it buy low, sell high? I don't really know what it is with Agapova anymore because... When she is in these fights, especially in the Moreau's fight, the commentary's like, look at her striking. She's just cocking back that left hand, and she's just walking around with her left hand just way out here and not doing anything. She's almost like bubbles on Trailer Park Boys, bit. like why I oughta, but then she never throws it. So it really is tough to tell what you're going to get out of both these women in this match. I think Maria could win this fight on the feet. The problem is, I just don't think this fight's going to be contested on the feet very much. I do like the wrestling out of Jillian Robertson. That's the one difference between these two fighters. Robertson's a good grappler, a good wrestler, and a poor striker if you just want to break down her game in the most basic of terms. Agapova, let's say, is a good yet basic striker. She at least has the advantage in that world, let's say, in this matchup. Isn't poor wrestler and is a good grappler, let's say, just to give her that benefit of the doubt. Julian Robertson has the ability to make this fight under whatever terms she wants them to be under. If she's comfortable with her striking, I think she will be able to go out there and work her own jab a little bit. I just don't love the striking of Robertson, so I don't think that's what we're going to see. But I do think that the wrestling of Robertson is at least going to be enough for her to gain top position, and that's really the key for both of these fighters. They can both look great in that top position, but they both do struggle defensively on the mat, and that's why I do think the wrestling is such an X factor for Robertson. And if you believe everything that she said, that's where she's invested for this camp. So you look at the odds in this one robertson opened as the underdog at plus 110 she's a minus 146 favorite of thereabouts on best fight odds for agapova open minus 130 plus 120 so the odds have flipped and if you liked agapova when she was the favorite maybe you really like her as she's the underdog we have a look at the topology votes matt surprise to us as they are to you 
Again, two performance bonuses for Agapova, but she's looked really bad in the two losses yeah. that she's had. And for Robertson, she's one and three in her last four. Some of them have been competitive. She struggled against decent wrestlers, but I'm going to say that the fans like Robertson. So I'll go over under 70% Robertson. I'll say under, but she'll be the favorite. Yeah, look at that. And they are really close. So 784 total votes, 55% with Robertson, 24% by decision, 68% by submission. For the 45% that have Agapova, 71% by decision. 9% by submission, 13% by knockout. The percentages are never exact to make 100, but they're close. For me, I look at this fight, Matt, and Agapova fought Tracy Cortez, who can wrestle, on Dana White's Contender Series. Two of those judges scored it 30-26, and one of them scored it 29-27. But Agapova struggled heavily with the wrestling in the first round and the second round. Couldn't get off her back. There was over 10 minutes of control time for Cortez. And then in the third round, Agapo was able to rally a little bit in that one. So maybe she's able to rally against Jillian Robertson or keep her off of her. But I like Robertson with her wrestling advantage. And again, we know that she... This is a fact. Jillian Robertson is the best submission threat in the UFC's flyweight division since it's existed. So I'm going to go with Robertson in this matchup. But it is a very volatile one. Exactly. And that's because neither fighter is the highest of ceilings. We're being completely honest with ourselves. Again, I do like the wrestling from Robertson. I think that'll help her dictate where this fight takes place. And if she's able to do that, I do like her to win by submit or by submission or decision. That's the thing. Both fighters are kind of susceptible to the submission, even though they both are very good in that realm. So I wouldn't be surprised if we got a finish on the map, but I just like Robertson. Let us know who you have in this matchup. Will it be Demon Slayer? Maria Gopova, aggressive nickname, taking on the Savage Dylan Robertson. It doesn't happen very often where we go with our fellow Canadian but both of us going with Robertson to get the win big time main event coming up this weekend Song Yudong's fighting Corey Sandhagen you better check it out keep it locked in with fighting name picks we always say let's, let's get, get into it, it. Lightweights looking for UFC number one coming up this weekend. We have Glory MMA Fitness's own Trey Samurai Ghost Ogden taking on the UFC debutant. It's Golden Boy Daniel Zen, Zell Huber. And Matt, when it comes to this one, I'm not in love with Samurai Ghost or Golden Boy, but it does come down to a very well matched fight at lightweight and a little bit of a contrast of styles. And I really do like this fight because for Trey Ogden, and I'm going to roll the clip. If you do look at it, I mean, for Dana White, he had this to say about Trey Ogden on Dana White's Looking for a Fight. He looked incredible on his feet. He looked unbelievable on the ground. The problem with him is he's like 30 or 31 years old. When it does come down to it, he wasn't happy that Trey Ogden was 31 or 30, 30 or 31 years old. He's a few months away from his 33rd birthday at this point. So for Ogden, the clock is ticking. You get a prime fighter in those prime years making his debut. And for Ogden, he was coming off of a win over JJ Okanovich on that show. And if you watch the highlights from the YouTube show, it's like, wow, this is a really well-matched fight. No, it's so close. And Okanovich is such a good fighter. Trey Ogden looked really good in that fight. He did. And he mopped him in that one. So then he comes in and he fights a guy that you know and love in Jordan Levitt. And Ogden was actually the favorite in that fight, which was a bit of a surprise when we made the it video. Was. We both took Jordan Levitt. Didn't think the fight was going to go the way the fight went because Jordan Levitt won a fight in a way I've never seen it won before. He won by throwing only leg kicks, defending punches and takedowns, and getting top control time. It is not the most aesthetically pleasing fight to watch. No, we go back and rewatch the fight so you don't have to. Trey Ogden didn't... I don't even know what to take. Like, okay, he couldn't defend takedowns from a very high-level wrestler. That's fine. Like, not a lot of guys can defend a lot of takedowns from a guy like Jordan Levitt. It's just the fact that Ogden wasn't able to land much of substance against a guy who wasn't offering much resistance on the feet. That was the big takeaway well, I had really? that was a little bit concerning. There just wasn't a lot of damaging shots. That's the problem. Uh, if you're going... Ogden's credited with the only takedown. Levitt isn't credited with any. But if you do look at it in the scrambles, in the exchanges, it's not... Levitt got top control, and that's pretty much it. But it was a really controversial split decision fight because a lot of people thought that Trey Ogden won that one. It was just a weird one, though, because it was, okay, do you want to take the strikes of Ogden or just sort of the weirdness and top control? It's just control, I guess, of uh, Levitt in that matchup. It was just a really weird fight. Again, I cannot sum it up any better than that. I think there's a better version of Trey Ogden locked in there, though. It was similar to what I had said about uh, Nicholas Mata against Jim Miller. You can't do any worse than you did in that one, so we're going to see a better version. But for Ogden, I do like 
like his boxing combinations. He's someone who does mix it up very well, too. He can throw with volume and with power. He's not just set in one of those two styles. The problem is, if you do offer him that, or if you do offer that wrestle threat, if you are a fighter who can fight with a lot of range, he will struggle in both of those capacities. So it would be nice if Trey Ogden would maybe go for his own takedown every now and then. Just mix it up a little bit. I know he's, he's capable of it. It just it feels like he's stuck in a gear every now and then. It would just be nice to see him use more variety in his fighting style. Because we'll see the boxing and then a reset, a weight. We'll see the really nice high kick. We didn't really see it much in that fight against Jordan Levitt. But the best part to Trey Ogden's game is his offensive and defensive grappling. He's very, very good in those positions. And Levitt's also very good in those positions. And he might be low on Levitt because he lost to Patty Pimblett. But just understand that Trey Ogden is a good grappler. You see it in the stat line. 11 wins by submission. And he can do it in a lot of different ways. But he is more of a single shot striker. He does have good takedown defense. Now, we're going to talk about the debuting fighter. All the shine. Undefeated. Daniel Zellhuber. A kid that's... And I say kid because he turned a pro at the age of 17. We have a fighter on Contender Series Week 11 that's going to have to get his parents to sign a permission slip because he's 17 and he's going to take a fight. Daniel Zellhuber was in that realm making his pro debut back in September of 2016. And boy, is he ever an impressive prospect. And... You hate to make a big-time comparison between Zell Huber and somebody else that's in the UFC, but Ignacio Bahamondes was that type of long, rangy, lightweight, kickboxer type of striker. And when I look at Zell Huber, pretty much the same. I mean, Bahamondes might have a few inches of, uh, you know, height, reaches about the same. He does on most middleweights, though. But from Zell Huber, holy crow, I mean, this guy's really strong and really tall, and he almost has to kind of duck down to fight a lot of these guys, but... When Zell Huber throws those kicks, there's so much power. When he implements his strikes, so much power. My big knock on Zell Huber before Dana White's Contender Series was kind of like Trey Ogden in a little bit of it. Single shot, reset, kick, reset, question mark, kick, reset. But when you watched him on Contender Series, first round Lucas Almeida, who Dana said after their fight, he said, man, Almeida lost the fight, but I'd love to sign him even if he was able to get back into the UFC. And Almeida did that, so credit to him. But first round Zell Huber Almeida... Almeida hits Zell Huber with the kitchen sink and a sledgehammer and doesn't knock him out. It's and then wild. round two, round three, Zell Huber is able to just rally. Almeida's kind of tired in those rounds, but Zell Huber is able to show out. I really do like the the overall kind of bare bones of his game. He's a really impressive fighter. And it is really nice to see a fighter like him, a power punching striker, build as a fight goes on. Like, that's normally one of the question marks you have around that fighting style. It's okay. They come with a big storm a la Rumble Johnson, but after the storm's gone, there's not much you have to deal with. So it was really nice to see Zell Hooper build as that fight continued. And if he's able to do that in the UFC while defending a lot of takedowns, while fighting at a very high pace, I could see him having a lot of success at this level. And at only 23 years of age like you had mentioned he's gonna get better and quite a bit better every single time we see him out there that's why this matchup against Ogden should be interesting though it could be sort of a stale first strand if we're being honest I could see them both going out there having a bit of an extended feeling out process until Ogden does start to feel uncomfortable on the feet then I do think he will mix in the takedown but the real question mark is is he gonna be able to take Zell Hooper down because if Daniel's able to keep it on his feet I do give him the advantage in that round. oh yeah 100% I mean when you do consider it Zell Hooper talked about so switching camps he talked about coming to the states wanted to make a name in the states he's fought for lux big fight organization icon and combate but if you do look at it and you go into his instagram june and july tiger muay thai he's training with the Askabob brothers where are they at matt one was supposed to make his uoc he debut was. where have you been he was also training with zubera takugov who's a great guy to train with for a matchup like this He's rounding it out at Extreme Couture. So, Tiger Muay Thai, you might not think of a grappling gym, but the training partners can grapple in Extreme Couture. That's exactly where you're going to be able to put that work in. If you look at it for Trey Ogden, very credited. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. He is one of the coaches at uh, the Glory MMA and Fitness's Overland Park location. And he can get it done on the mat. So, when it does come down to it, love the experience that Zell Huber has on the regional scene. Some of the names, not that great, is when kind of going on to Dana White's Contender Series was over a less than stellar fighter making his pro debut. But the wins that he has over uh, Barahona, he was able to defend the takedowns by using the ropes because Icon was fighting on the ropes that night and get into mount. And he was also able to get a win over Miguel Arizmendi, whose record's 8-8 eight and eight now. It was 8-4 and four when they fought. But Arizmendi fought, and I want to make sure I get this right, he fought Renato Valdez, Zell Huber, and then Michael Morales all back-to-back. All UFC fighters now. So... It is a good level of competition that he has faced. It's just, can he beat guys that are 
kind of in that mid-range before he gets up there. Or can Trey Ogden kind of turn away a prospect, which he wasn't necessarily able to do in his debut? And can he just ascend up the rankings in his prime age? This feels like a uh, parlay buster, if there ever was one for this card. Because for Zell Hubbard, I do think he does have the higher ceiling. I, I do expect him to get the win in this matchup. Like, that is the pick. But the well-rounded game of Trey Ogden is one where, okay, let's say he is struggling on the feet. He takes a beating. He could just somehow work his way into a submission. He's got that type of style to him. So this is a very volatile fight, even though Zell Huber does seem to be quite a big favorite. Zell Huber is a pretty big favorite. Open in minus 240 is minus 260 right now. If you look at it for Trey Ogden, open plus 200, plus 210 or thereabouts. We have a look at the topology votes, Matt. Surprised us there to you. I bet fans don't like Trey Ogden very much. And I'm going to say over under 80% Daniel Zell Huber. 80? I'll say under, but it'll be the favorite. It is over 823 total votes, 89% Zell Huber, uh, 28% by decision, 6% by submission, 60% by knockout for the 11% that have Ogden, 60% by decision, 18% by submission, 9% by knockout. I think if Ogden wins and it's not a hot take, it's going to be by submission. Daniel Zell Huber in some of his fights coming up was susceptible to getting taken down. And as I mentioned, his second to last fight, or third to last fight, he was defending takedowns, but bouncing off the rope and getting on top of his opponent, something that obviously he can't do in the cage. I love the kicks out of Zell Huber. He will throw a question mark kick, which we love. He'll throw teeps to the body. He'll throw great leg kicks. He has really good volume when he decides to use it, and he has a pretty good gas tank. Trey Ogden, to me, feels like he could be the kryptonite to everything that Zell Huber has. It's just, can he not get knocked out? That's why I've got Golden Boy. I think he's going to be able to land enough power shots on the feet to make a difference and to really make those damaging shots count in the minds of the judges. And that's why I've got Zell Huber in this one. Uh, going with Zell Huber as well, I think he's a very, very good striker. And again, like you said, it feels like that big warning, warning, pop and popcorn right next to it. Because just about the entire time I was watching the tape, I thought, hey, Trey Ogden's got this one in the bag. I just think Zell Huber is that kind of special striker. So for me, going with Mexico is Daniel Zell Huber. Had a Mexican striker who I thought was all that in a bag of popcorn and Melissa Martinez last weekend. She loses to Elise Reed. Both of us with Zell Huber in this one. Let us know who you have down below because Trey Ogden feels like a pretty good underdog pick if you're going to go that way. If you like Zell Huber, let us know as well. Main event this weekend. Corey Sandhagen taking on Song Dong. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks, we always say. Let's get into it. And a welcome to the UFC, to Brazil's D. Gomes, who's coming in off of Dana White's Contender Series Week 5. We're already into Week 8, so it hasn't been all that long for Gomes. She picked up a big-time decision win over Ryane Amanda. And if you look at it for Gomes, trains out of Piranha Valley Tudo. A great gym with Jessica Andrade, Carol Hosa. I mean, the list of names goes on. And Maria Oliveira. Like, there's so many great women that train at that gym at a very high level that it works out great for Gomes. And if you look at it for her pretty darn good level competition 100%. as well i mean coming in she got a win on invicta and i struggle mightily to pronounce her opponent's name but it was milana dudieva former ufc fighter she gets the win over there by knockout she fights amanda about a well just a few weeks ago it'll be three weeks i was gonna say to the day but it's a tuesday to a saturday but again she gets this fight on short notice taking on loma look when me and matt People know Loma Look Me. They've known her for a very long time. And if we get into the nitty gritty, Thai national team for Muay Thai. She started to switch from Muay Thai over to MMA in 2017. Made her MMA debut in 2018. She went, uh, what, like 3-1? and one? And then she ended up in the UFC and she's been 3-2 and two since. And she struggled with the takedown in some of her fights. She's been taken down in pretty well every fight in the UFC. But the weird thing is, in the fights that she's won, she's kind of incorporated it into her own game to accentuate her striking. And she's played out pretty well. I mean, you do look at the wins. You look at the losses. She beats Alexandra Albu, who's no longer with the promotion by split decision. Lose to Angela Hill. Beats Jinyu Fry, beats Sam Hughes, and doesn't get taken down in that fight, I should add. And loses to Lupe Godinez. But Matt, for Loma Lukbunmi, very crisp striking, very mean when she decides to strike. I would not want to fight Loma Lukbunmi, nor would I want to fight D. Gomes. But when you do look at this matchup, for Lukbunmi, she was always a staple of Tiger Muay Thai. But she got into MMA because of the Hickman brothers, followed them to their new gym, Bangtown Muay Thai. 
where the champ trains in this division. So that's pretty cool to see. Zhang Wei Li is there. But again, the Hickman Brothers staples of her camp. And I think this is going to be a really fun fight between a couple of fighters who pride themselves on their Muay Thai skills. It should be a really fun fight. The thing with Loma Look Me is I throw her in a bit of that Tony Gravely category where she's fought the better levels of competition, I would say. Angela Hill was a ranked fighter at one point. Lupita Godinez is no scrub by any means. But like you had said, Loma Look Me has been around for a while now. Or at least it's felt like she's been around for a while now and I really did think she was gonna be able to break her way into the rankings at some point throughout her UFC tenure and the fact there were this many fights in and she's fighting somebody on what three weeks notice coming off contender series is a little bit surprising because with Luke with me she's very interesting technique wise yes she's very good but the size disadvantage that she has in this weight class is always going to come back to bite her it doesn't matter how crisp of a striker you are if you can't engage in the range of your opponent and as we have seen in her losses a lot of fighters who can stick use their footwork a lot mix in their own takedown to sort of put out the fire when she does start to go with her own striking. There is a game plan there to beat somebody like Loma Look With Me, and that's why I'm always curious if she ever will add a new wrinkle to her game. She has been able to use the offensive takedown a lot more as of late, but I do think that's more of a matter of her having to rush in because of her striking style. She's not somebody who can really afford to kick on the outside, a la, even think of like a Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson throws a lot of push kicks, right? Those push kicks aren't necessarily... Loma throws a lot of push kicks too. I know, but let me finish. Tony Ferguson throws a push kick to keep his opponent away from him, to keep the range exactly where he wants it to be. But when he throws the push kick, his opponents aren't in range to throw strikes back. With Loma Look With Me, it won't affect her in this matchup, but her push kick is going to get her into a lot of people's punching ranges. That's just the problem with Look With Me and her physicality in this weight class. Again, I don't think it's a necessarily a factor that's going to pop up in this fight, because this will be one of the few times where both these fighters are pretty much the exact same size. I doubt either one's going to have a big advantage over the other one physically. But again, for Look With Me, I like her in the range that she's good at. It's just in this weight class and with her size, those are very specific ranges. When you do look at it, I mean, for Look With Me, she was originally supposed to be taking on Diana Balbizia this weekend, so that's kind of the reason why it's such a short notice exactly. fighter. And the other answer to your question, Look With Me, if you go over to her Instagram, she was finally finishing up her schooling over the last year. But so even, graduated, and that's the reason why she was away. I, Jane, just to my whole point about record, I know she's fighting Balbizia, but even uh, Balbizia, I would see, is kind of around this level. I don't look at her as steps above this by any means. Who the hell do you want Loma Look With Me to be fighting? Um, an Ashley Yoder type, maybe? Just, again, anybody with a, a slightly... 500 big... fighters, Ashley Yoder. A fighter with a bigger name. That's my only point. She's been around this weight class for a long time. There's not a lot of unranked fighters in this weight class. I would just like to see Loma Look With Me fight more recognizable names this far into her career. Well, again, when it does come down to this matchup, you do have two Muay Thai strikers. And considering it for uh, Den Denise Gomez here, if you do look at it, she has bantamweight experience, flyweight experience, and a little bit of strawweight experience. So I would think even though the heights and the reaches are fairly similar, Gomez is actually going to have a decent size advantage in a matchup like this. So if you do look at the odds in the matchup... Loma opened a pretty big favorite, minus 275, minus 255 or thereabouts right now. For Gomes, opened up at a plus 235, plus 205 as it stands. We have a look at the topology votes in this one, Matt. Surprised us, they are to you. And I wouldn't be surprised if topology is actually going the way of the short notice fighter. I'm going to say over under 60% for Brazil's D. Gomes. I think look is going to be a favorite. Okay. Big, big. Okay, completely wrong by me. 672 total votes, 71% look on me, 91% by decision. For Gomes, 29% uh, have her to win, 74% by decision. So most seeing this going the way of a decision. Who wins the decision? That's the question, man. I like Look With Me by decision. I, I think her work rate's really going to help her in this matchup, and that's the thing. I know she has to get this fight into a specific range, into that close-range Muay Thai, but I think this is the fighter that will allow her to get into those ranges. I like her elbows on the inside. I do like her uh, overall output in this fight, and that's why I do favor her. Again, I don't think this fight's going to end by stoppage, even though these two are very good strikers. They're not necessarily the most heavy-handed strikers out there, even though Gomes does have a good level of finishers on her record. I just don't think it's going to be easy to go out there and finish somebody like Loma look than me. Belbizia, long range striker for the division. Gomes, short range Muay Thai striker. And when it comes to Gomes, if you look at her last fight against Rani Amanda, taller fighter, longer fighter, needs to get the fight down to the ground. And she negated all of that and lit her up on the feet and threw really good volume too. So both of these fighters well matched. If they had full camps, it'd probably be a really good fight. I like Loma look than me. I like the consistency with that volume that we've seen in her fights. The added wrinkle that, whoop, Grabbed your leg. Now I can go for the takedown. I do like Loma Lukbumi in this one. I think it's going to be a really good fight. And if you like the fact that, hey, 
those odds are so far apart. Maybe like Gomes on short notice. Maybe that's the play. But let us know down below in the comment section who you have in this matchup. In the main event of this card, you have Corey Sandhagen, who's coming off an interim title loss, taking on Song Yudong, who's riding a wave of success. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. As we always say, let's get into it. A matchup this weekend in the women's bantamweight division that contains one half of the ranked fighters on this entire card. We have Aspen Ladd taking on Sarah McMahon. No nicknames for these ladies. And Matt, we have to start the video off right here. For Fight Night Picks fans, you just got to get it over with. You got to rip it off like it's a band-aid. I'm confident in speaking for the both of us when I say... I have no fucking idea which version of Sarah McMahon comes out this weekend, considering the fact that in her last fight, I fully, and so did you, expected Carol Hosa to beat Sarah McMahon easily, considering Sarah McMahon was over 40 then, and she hasn't reversed age, she's still over 40 right now, and Sarah McMahon completely sucked the air out of the room for pretty well that entire fight up until some moments in the third round, took her down, held her down, and won that fight. Yeah, she was able to use what her foundation is, which was nice to see. But that still is the problem with Sarah McMahon. It's tough to have any confident, pick, any level of confidence. Picking a fighter who is 41 years old. Weeks away from 11 her. months, 3 weeks, and 3 days. Like, uh, Sarah McMahon is not new to this sport by any means. I think she competed in, what, the 2004 Olympics? That was a long time ago, guys. So Meddled. Metal. Exactly, but that's the wild thing. Like it, it's been a very long time since Sarah McMahon has been at the peak of or at the peak of her physical capabilities. This is the weird thing about this fight, though. This could have been like the main event of a fight night two years ago. I, I know that's wild to say, and maybe Sarah McMahon wasn't necessarily at the spot in her career that could have warranted such a shot. But still, these two fighters were extremely high profile at one point of their careers, and that's why it's very surprising to see them on kind of a light fight night card. For being honest, just buried on the prelims. Sarah McMahon fought Ronda Rousey. Aspen Ladd fought Norma Dumont in the main event of Fought a fight night show, but still. Former champ Jermaine Duran to me. Exactly. She's it got was over quick, but multiple, she fought her. Multiple main event opportunities. And those are things that a lot of really good fighters in the organization are never going to be able to do. So the fact that the organization uh, by the UFC had that much stock in Aspen Ladd it kind of tells you where her stock was at one point. Now, it has definitely fallen off such a high pedestal. But the weird thing about Aspen Ladd is, and I know I haven't talked a lot about their fighting styles. A lot of people know who these fighters are to begin with. Do you agree with me? I don't think Aspen Ladd is a very different version now from when she first came into the UFC. If she gets on top of you, it's going to be a problem. She has good submissions. She's very strong in that position. Has phenomenal ground and pound. You know the works. But other than that one position, what has Aspen Ladd done in her career that's really improved since she joined the UFC? Matt, you took the question I was going to ask you away from me. That, that was my there question for you. It's, it's pretty well the same thing. I mean, when we're competing on the feet, she can do a couple of different things. But she really will fight behind a jab, throw a power shot here you're and there. stiff if you're a good striker. Trying to work in her own takedowns. But the trouble is, her takedown defense, not really the best. And she struggles against volume punchers. She struggles against some pressure fighters like Raquel Pennington in their fight the last time out she loses to norma dumont and it was well documented and the internet kind of went in a little bit of a i don't know they went haywire with that fight because her volume was so low was she had no fight. answers for norma dumont until what round four round five when she finally started to turn it up the fight against Durand, I mean, she thought it was controversial the stoppage but it was what it was but before that she had a fight in the night against the jerry eubank she had a performance bonus over former invicted two-time champion Tanya Evinger. A tough lady. And then a win over Lena Landsberg, who's still doing the damn thing. But when I do look at it for Aspen Ladd, we haven't seen a giant progression. We never really saw that, hey, she is the contender that we thought she was out of her so far. She's stuck in that Macy Chasson category. Her and, and Aspen Ladd, they're both right there as they just can't seem to break through. So this is the opportunity for the younger Ladd to beat a, a decent name in Sarah McMahon, but vice versa. You realize Sarah... Uh, Aspen Ladd doesn't have great takedown defense. Sarah McMahon's just going to go in there and do what she does. But that is the thing. Like, go back to Sarah McMahon's fight against Catlin Vieira. And I know Catlin is a much better jiu-jitsu ace than Aspen Ladd. But I would say with their top control, they are somewhat similar. 
When Catlin, okay, Sarah McMahon gets on top of Catlin, gets her into a head and arm choke, can't finish the position, which elongates the grappling exchange. Catlin immediately gets on top of Sarah McMahon and puts her in the exact same position. Where Catlin was able to fight out of, though, Sarah McMahon was not and got caught in the exact same submission. That's the difference between these two fighters, and I guess that's what makes them the same. Aspen Lab, if she gets into that position, is going to look for ground and pound, going to try to uh, uh, open Sarah McMahon up that way. But Sarah McMahon herself isn't great on the back foot. I just don't know if Aspen Lab, like, how does Aspen Ladd get on top of Sarah McMahon in the first place? I think in the wrestling, it's going to be difficult for her. She might be able to sweep her off her back, but the thing about Ladd is she can be somewhat heavy on her back and not really look for a lot of sweeps. It's more submissions than anything. And if she's not able to get those submissions, she just kind of gets held down, which would help Sarah McMahon. So this could, the more I'm talking myself into it, this could be one of those weird fights where Sarah McMahon looks great for like 11 and a half minutes. We're in the third round. Sarah McMahon hype train. Hashtag, what last friend? To quote uh, Alistair Overy, and then Aspen Ladd catches her in some kind of a guillotine. So the questions that you asked, you got to break it down really quick. Sarah McMahon against Catlin Vieira, I agree with you. And then Sarah McMahon against Juliana Pena, pretty well the same deal. Like we're we're wrestling until we can't, we get caught in a submission. The fight against Catlin Vieira was almost five years ago. The fight against Juliana Pena was a few years ago. McMahon takes a long time off between Pena and Hosa. I expected Carol Hosa to do the exact same thing, and she wasn't able to get out of those positions. I think it's fair to say, though, that Ketlin and Julia, Juliana are on far different levels than Carol Hosa. I, we both thought that Carol Hosa no, was No, I know that, level. but I'm still saying, like, one was the champion, and the other yeah. one was uh, knocking on a title shot's door. That's all I'm saying. I get it. It's just, it's really, really weird when you're trying to do this. So, Matt, for Aspen Lad, opened up a plus 155 underdog. You heard that right. The line adjusted fairly quickly. Minus 130 is the favorite. Sarah McMahon open minus 180, plus 145 or thereabouts. So the line is completely switched. And that's really the weirdest part about, or sorry, I should have said plus 107. So they are closer than that. But when you do look at it, the, the line has shifted quite a bit. We have a look at the topology votes. I would expect the voters to have Aspen Ladd. I'm going to say over under 70% Ladd. Here's the weird thing about Aspen Ladd. Fought at 125, has weight issues making 135. Like, the weight cut's always been a problem for the her. The on parallels are there. Uh, exactly. I just, Aspen Ladd's one of the fighters who, again, do I have the most stock in this fight on the card? No. But th she's one of the fighters that you really have to watch out for on weigh-in day because that can really make it break it for an Aspen Ladd performance. That's all and, I want to And this matchup was originally booked for UFC San Diego last month. Ladd out. She posted on her Instagram. She had a bad vote with COVID. So that's all it was. But, but what did you put the odds at? Sorry for the topology vote. 70% uh, Aspen Ladd over under. I think they'll be over, but I don't like it. No. Whoa, look at that. 819 total votes. This is just a mind melter. 53% McMahon, 90% by decision. For the 47% that I've led, 81% by decision, 12% by knockout. So Matt, Ladd was the underdog. Now she's the favorite, and the fans don't have her, slightly. Sarah McMahon was the favorite. Now she's the underdog, and the fans like her. My brain doesn't know how to process this fight, by the way, to the fans out there. This is a really hard one, you folks. Call me ageist, but if Sarah McMahon was 39 years old, 11 months, at three weeks and three days, I'd have a much easier time picking her. I do like her wrestling, but you the problem is... You just saw her beat Hosa back I, in Columbus. Carol Hosa's not Aspen Ladd, though. Aspen Ladd was someone who, at one point in this division, was looked at like she could fight for the title. I know she's dropped down from that point, but still, Aspen Ladd was one of the hottest prospects in the Bantamweight division. She was in there with the likes of, like, a Ketlin Vieira. I know those are two prospects who haven't really fulfilled their destiny, if you will, but still, very high level fighters at the time. <sighs> I, again, I'm having a hard time with this fight because I think there's a world where Sarah McMahon does struggle initiating the takedown and getting it, and I think that if she does get tired in the second round, third round from striking a little bit, that might open up some of the game from Aspen Ladd and maybe even open up her own takedown. I know how crazy that sounds. I'm picking a 41-year-old, though. Let's have a little bit of fun. I am going to pick Sarah McMahon. I like her wrestling. I think that if she can get Aspen Ladd down, that's the thing. Ladd has great top control when she's on top of the ground. She does struggle to get back up from the mat. So I'll say Aspen Ladd is the higher potential to get a finish win, but I'll say Sarah McMahon by decision. I mean, pop that top button. Matt's just completely changing right here. And then the folks do think you can be a little bit ageist at time. I agree. I have Sarah McMahon in this one. Surprised that the odds flipped the way that they did. I know Ladd... Had a lot of hype, and and I do think, just like you said, if you're going with a finish in this one, Aspen Ladd, 100%. If, if McMahon tires, Ladd can throw some of those boxing combinations that have a little bit of sting behind them. She does look to have pretty good cardio in some of her fights, and if you do look on the Instagram, always out there, running hills, doing mountain climbs, all that stuff, all great stuff. 
I like the McMahon switched it up and you know different gyms that she's trained at team alpha male whatever revolution mixed martial arts seems to be a great home for her. she's really honed in on her bjj out of that extra little wrinkle to hold you down and figure out positions a little bit more when she's on the ground so i do like mcmahon with the takedowns in this one i never thought i'd say it you never thought you'd say it we're ripping the band-aid let us know if we're completely off our rockers in this one in the comments both of us going with the silver medalist Olympian Sarah McMahon to get the win. Big time main event coming up this weekend. Corey Sandhagen taking on Song Yadong. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with fighting picks. We always say, let's get into it. Coming up this weekend, Welterweights looking to get back in the win column. We have, listen, it's the problem. Trevin Giles versus the monster Louis Kose. Now, it seems like they've retired those nicknames, but can the problem be a problem for the monster? Can the monster become the problem's problem? We're going to find that out this weekend. And if you look at it for Trevin Giles, I mean, crazy transformation for his last fight. Because this is a guy that's fought at light heavyweight in the UFC. Got a win there over James Boknovic. Fought pretty well his entire career at middleweight. Former, what was he, LFA middleweight champ, RFA, or at least he fought the best of the best with the organizations that were. And if you look at it for Giles, I mean, just a laundry list of contenders he's fought. He has a win over Ryan Spann. He's fought Brendan Allen. He's fought really good competition in the UFC. And you consider it, you look at the last two fights where he's been finished, and I mean, yeah, listen, will it happen against Drikas Duplessis? I guess. Is Drikas going to fight Darren Till? That's kind of up in the air. Will it happen against Michael Morales? It will. It I will guess, happen. and it did. So it was weird to see for Giles having fought 17 fights to then go down to welterweight. He's kind of taken a little bit of a hiatus from being a police officer from all accounts. And this is the last fight on his deal coming off two pretty bad knockout losses, really. Fighting Louis Kosi, a power puncher who punched his power in the first round against Sasha Polotnikov. And Tried to wrestle in the second and third rounds, didn't have the gas left, and then since, and I listened to an interview that he did with James Lynch, and I want to make sure there's a lot of James Lynch interviews this week with all different organizations. So this one was with, uh, who was it, MMA News. He did the interview there. He said he had both shoulders cleaned up. That's the reason for the layoff. Like Paul George. It's been about two years away. He's really taken advantage of the PI, training with a lot of great people in Vegas, getting ready for this fight. But for Kosi, the, the question marks were always, he had never fought a good level of competition. He beat off Danny McWilliams, who his brother had already beat off, and both the Shabazian brothers had beaten off Danny McWilliams. So big wins over McWilliams. But for Kosi, can he power punch against Trevin Giles, or can Trevin Giles just take win or rest on his laurels and get a win here against Kosi? It's not as cut and dry as that, but Giles is struggling against some of these power shots. It's wild that Giles has twice as much professional experience, though, because Giles himself doesn't even have that much professional experience. Like, 18 fights is good, but, like, these people have 18 fights in the UFC, not just in their professional careers. So it is kind of a, a extreme, I should say, to see Giles have this much of an edge with his experience. But, and I'm really this one-sided in a pick. I think Trevin Giles is the much more skilled guy in this matchup. I worry about the weight cut, and like you had said, Luis Cose does have incredible power when he's able to land those power shots. But the thing about Giles is he has good footwork, and I know how sometimes it gets him into trouble. Even think back to the Drinkus Du Plessy fight. Drinkus is the weirdest, like drunken Shaolin fighter you've ever seen. He's just like, does everything wrong and then his power somehow wins out. But that's exactly what happened in that fight. Trevin Giles is backing him up. He's looking really good with some of his single shots. And then he walks into a really big power shot from Duplessis. And like you had just said, Duplessis is being talked about having a fight with a guy like Darren Till or at least other people in and around the rankings. So that tells you how good a guy like Drikas is. I don't think Luis Cose is on that level. I think, yes, do the thing that they have in common is that their power is an outlier for both of them? Yes, it is. But I don't think Kose has the same ways to land the power as Drikas did. And that's why I like Trevin in this fight. When you look at it for both these guys, for Trevin Giles, even in his last fight against Morales, you watch the, fir watch the first minute and a half of that fight and tell me who's winning the fight. It's Trevin Giles. Trevin Giles is going out there, throwing that big power jab of his, really leaning into it, but throwing a really zippy right hand. And if you do look at it, he drops Morales with the right hand. It sends Morales back to the cage. He goes wobble leg. He kind of picks himself back up. They might not consider it a knockdown, but he did send him flying. And then right after he does it, Giles clenches up. And I thought, what the hell is he doing here? This is terrible. If you know anything about Michael Morales, his judo's great. His wrestling's great. It's a way that he wins out in a lot of his fights. And his striking happens to be very good, too. I think he's going to have a great future in the UFC. But Giles grapples. 
And then Giles gets the takedown. It's like, holy smokes, like this is really impressive. They get back up, they start to strike again. It's a right straight and then an uppercut from Morales that drops Giles and that's pretty much all she wrote. So if you do consider it for Giles, again, very good level of competition, adept in the wrestling offensively and defensively. He does like to bounce on his feet with his hands fairly low, kind of like an Andrew Sanchez would in the past, but Sanchez had success with it and Sanchez got caught by it. And for Trevin Giles, he's had success with it. And he's also gotten caught by it. So we'll see what happens in the matchup. Because for Kosi, he can wrestle offensively. It was always that threat of, well, how good's the level of competition? The craziest part is, he loses to Sasha Palatnikov and then misses the entire Palatnikov experience that was UFC, XMMA, everywhere. They now train together at Syndicate, so that's pretty wild. He also trained quite a bit with Daniel Rodriguez for Rodriguez's fight against Li Jingliang, but also for his fight. That's the thing about Kosei, though. We question his level of competition coming into the UFC. They lost to Sasha Palatnikov. Sasha Palatnikov's Co- not like Li Jingliang. Co- He's not Shavkat Rachmanov. He's not like... Kosi was a minus 600 yeah. favorite against Palatnikov. I too. remember thinking Kosi was going to look amazing, and he did until he didn't. <laughs> Gosh darn it. Because that's the thing. Once his cardio does start to fall off, the looping shots become much more easy to uh, see coming. And if Giles can utilize some of that footwork, use some of his range finders to then lead uh, up his power shots, I think Giles can have a lot of success in this matchup. Again, it's rare that I'm confident in a fighter coming off two stoppage losses, fighting in a weight class that I'm not even really sure he belongs in to begin with. I just think that when you break down these guys skill skill for skill well the mountain that trevin giles skill set sits on is a lot higher than the mountain that Luis kose skill set sits on but they're both mountains it's not like a mountain and an anthill right i'd say a mountain and like a snow pile oh well matt when we have a look at the odds in this matchup trevin giles open to minus 200 minus 210 there's a lot here craig could be a big pile it snows in september i don't think so Luis kose open to plus 170 Plus 180 as it stands. We have a look at the topology mats votes. Matt, and I don't expect that they're all that close. I'm going to say over under 85% Giles. I think they'll be under, but it'll still be on his side. It's slightly under. 834 total votes. 81% Giles. 26% by decision. 68% by knockout. For the 19% that have Kosi, 29% by decision. 55% by knockout. I would think more people would have Kosi to win by knockout. Considering some of these shots that have knocked out Trevin Giles, it is very worrisome. I mean, that fight against uh morales he gets sent down the referee holding him and giles kind of protests a little bit but he was definitely knocked out and knocked out hard he took a lot of shots when he was kind of covering up and getting hit by morales i do think giles has the skill set to beat kosi i do obviously love the fact that he's fought a a lot of very high level fighters i thought for giles maybe somewhere in the periphery in the range of like 25 to 20 maybe just bridging a little bit further at middleweight but I'm surprised he's here at welterweight. Maybe Kosi's the guy to catch him. But I do have Giles in this one. I still don't have a lot of confidence in Kosi moving forward, if I'm being completely honest. Like, his game is sort of one note. It's very power-oriented. And once that power does start to fade, there's not really a plan B or a plan C. And that's where I do think Trevin Giles can have success. I think he can use his jab, can use his footwork. He does have good cardio to go along with his output, too. So I think that if Kosei does start to slow down at any point throughout this fight, that's when Giles can start to uptick his own work rate. Maybe even look for a finish. Both of us going with Trevin Giles to Get the win. Let us know if you have Kosi here with the power shots and you're worried about the chin of Trevin Giles in the matchup. Some big time fights on this card. Pat Sabatini, Damon Jackson next. You're not going to want to miss. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's get into it. The underground knows about this featherweight fight right here. Coming up, a couple of great grapplers. We have the leech, Damon Jackson, taking on a man with no fixed nickname, Pat Sabatini. Daniel Gracie's own, a guy that trains out of one of the winningest gyms that you don't really hear enough of. I mean, Paul Felder will tell you about it just about every single weekend. But when you do look at this matchup, Matt, a couple of guys that are really sketchy with what they'll do when they're on the mat. And if you look at it for Jackson... He took a super, super short notice replacement opponent his last time out in Dan Argetta. And he backpacked him for like three entire rounds. And if you do look at the end of the fight, Jackson's got a big shiner. It's because Argetta had really, really sneaky placed shots like this. And he just kept whacking the mole. It was more of an accumulation, yeah. Hey, he did a great job, did Argetta landing those punches. But Jackson, with the control time, did a great job. But when I do look at Damon Jackson's overall body of work, you might know him for his original UFC tenure where he went... 0-1 0-1 with a draw and a no contest. And they said, okay, get some more experience. Get some seasoning. So he became the LFA featherweight champ. He fought over with the PFL. And he did get finished with one of the craziest flying knee knockouts by one of the best featherweights that's not competing in the UFC in Mavlid Haibulaev. 
But for Damon Jackson, this recent run with the UFC really is special. And if you do look at it, 4-1 and one since 2020. Last three fights have been wins. And in those last three fights, 25 minutes plus of control time. It's wild to see how much control time the former NIA All-American uh, wrestling star has been able to accumulate in the UFC. And you do consider it. Even in the fight that Damon Jackson took in his UFC re-entry. Two days notice against Mursad Bektic. He gets taken down over and over and over again until he gets that kind of Hail Mary Pop submission. Winning a big time performance bonus there. But you do look at it for Damon Jackson. And again, I think sketchy is the best word to use about him. I, when I think of Damon Jackson, I think of like the Colts bend but don't break defense when they had Peyton Manning as their quarterback. Because with Damon Jackson, he's very good all around. Like there's not a single part of his uh, game where he's just awful at. I'd say his striking somewhat slow, but it's not like he doesn't know what he's doing on the feet by any means. The great thing about Jackson is the second you show any level of weakness in your game, whether it's with your cardio, with your striking defense, with your grappling, he's going to try to exploit that. And he's not going to stop trying to exploit that one weakness in your game. And that's why Jackson is such a tough fight on the come up for a lot of these prospects. We see a lot of prospects get turned away at the Damon Jackson door because of all the different wrinkles he can bring to the game and for his finishing potential too. He's not just a guy who's going to go in there, try to wrestle his way to a decision. He can get submissions. He can get TKOs. And that's what makes him so dangerous. But it's going to be really interesting to see how his grappling fares against Pat Sabatini, who up until this point has shown nothing but promise on the mat with his own grappling. He has been phenomenal with his own... Uh, not only wrestling, but just his grappling sequences. He's someone who can go from a bad position into a good one. You know, let's go back to that Jamal Embers fight where he gets dropped in what? It feels like the first punch that's thrown his way. Jamal Embers cracks him, hurts him really bad. Sabatini immediately goes for the leg, starts grappling, works in an ankle lock, and it just shows how high level he is, even when he is hurt in a fight against another top-tier guy. I know Jamal Embers isn't necessarily thought at of, like, you know, he's not a top-15 fighter or anything, but if you're locked in there with Jamal Embers, it's going to be a tough night no matter who you are, and I really like that win out of Pat Sabatini. It showed growth because we don't know how a fighter is going to look when they face adversity until they face adversity. And uh, the way he looked in that matchup really gave me confidence in his ceiling moving forward. When you look at it for Sabatini, 4-0 in the UFC. Pre-UFC took on really good level of competition. Beat Tony Gravely at one point. Beat Damon Blackshear who's now in the UFC. He was a two-time CFFC featherweight champ. But when I do go through everything, he's going from 5'6 TJ Laramie to 5'11 Damon Jackson. So a big difference there. And he talked about it. Like never really struggles in some of these positions. First round against TJ Laramie he loses that round. Laramie is all over him with the wrestling. And then round two, Sabatini's able to take over. Round three, he really does take over. And if you do consider it, out of Sabatini's last two fights, four judges' scorecards equaled out to 30-26. That's just how powerful he's been able to equate. And again, I thought he lost round one against Laramie, but what have you. He did get five takedowns against Tucker Lutz. He got six against Laramie. That's the other thing for Sabatini. You look at the first two fights that he has in the UFC. You had mentioned the one against uh, Jamal Emers where he gets rocked and then he rallies back. You figure the fight that he has against Tristan Connolly, he's able to win out quite well. But the level of competition for Sabatini, the last two fights, Tucker Lutz and then TJ Laramie. Laramie's out of the UFC after that loss and Tucker Lutz, he's a power puncher. He's got pretty good striking, but he struggles in some of the grappling. This is finally that level up oh, in an opponent that you want to see out of Sabatini. And these guys, their skill sets mesh so well. Because for Sabatini, when he strikes, he just kind of holds his hands down by his chest. Puts his head down and throws a lot of leg kicks all of a sudden. He doesn't really box much. He just tries to close the distance, go for power takedowns. He for, showed the body kick, though, in his last fight to look good. For Damon Jackson, with his striking, he holds his hands really high. And he will kind of crane his neck over because he's taller than most featherweights. Throw a little bit like this. Go for a body lock. Try and get his takedowns. He'll throw some leg kicks as well. But not really either one of these men. You're going to go, geez, that guy's a premier top 10 striker in the UFC's featherweight no, division. But they could be top 10 grapplers, and that's what you like. This one I do like out of Sabatini, though, especially his last two fights. And I know they were against lesser levels of competition, but they did allow him to show at least steady improvements with his striking. I'm not saying we're going to see Sabatini go out there and outstrike guys in the top 15 anytime soon, but I just liken it to, like, the Marvin Vittori effect, if you will. If you can just improve that part of your game enough to make those entries a little bit easier, it's going to help your game overall, not just striking for striking's sake. I think... 
This is a weird comparison. It's like reintroducing wolves to Yellowstone. It helps the whole ecosystem. I think with Pat Sabatini, if he could level up his striking, even another 5-10%, I think that would help his grappling a lot more. Just because it would make fighters respect that part of his game, make their hands come a little bit higher, and it would allow him to go for a lot more of his wrestling with a little bit more ease. Matt, we have a look at the odds in this matchup. Jackson open the underdog, plus 190. Still the underdog, plus 160 or thereabouts for Sabatini. Open plus 225, minus, or sorry, geez. Minus 225, now minus 205. We have a look at the topology votes. You've been bullish on Pat Sabatini this entire run, and I think the fans enjoy his fights as well. I'm going to say over under 70% Sabatini. I'll say over. I'll say over. It is over. 861 total votes, 83% Sabatini, 77% by decision. For the 17% that have Jackson, 66% by decision. Jackson doesn't have the hottest takedown defense in the entire UFC throughout this round. Obviously, he's looked very, very good of late. You consider the first run, it wasn't very good, so 40% is what it is. Goes for a lot of offensive takedowns on his own, but when he does get taken down, his threat of the submission is definitely there, and he wins the fight. So, Matt, Damon Jackson, squeaky little record. Pat Sabatini, about the same. I think there's going to be a lot of Sabatini support down in the comment section this week. I think there will be too, but it does make sense, and this is where I differentiate these two fighters. Pat Sabatini, when he's on top, I think he's going to go for a lot of ground and pound to really try to soften up Damon Jackson to make the fight at least more even as it goes on. Because if Jackson has any outlier attribute, I'd say it's probably his cardio. Like, this guy, I know he's been TKO'd early. The top hurry of loss is one that stands The high boule of loss. But, like... If you He fights a lot like Julian Arosa. We bring these two guys up a lot together because they do fight in a similar manner. If you don't get rid of them early, they're going to make it really ugly by the time things are done. I still think Jackson's going to be able to be on top of Sabatini a lot in this fight, whereas Sabatini, if he is able to get that top control, is going to make a lot of use of it. So that's why I do ever so slightly favor Sabatini. But I think this is a really difficult fight for him. I know, like you had said, I've been on this streak of his, but I think Jackson definitely is a step up in competition over his last two fights. Now, if he is able to get over Damon Jackson, Jackson, then maybe a borderline ranked opponent, if I'm being honest. I think it has been that long for Sabatini, but this is a very fun fight. I'll be honest with everybody out there. I'm really on the fence with this one. When I look at Damon Jackson being that big of an underdog, having not lost two grapplers like this in years, in years, I'm really, really torn. But when I do look at Sabatini, what I do like is he's always trying to do something. So is Jackson. But when you watch Sabatini, if he's on his back, he wants to get off of his back very quick. He's not like a traditional wrestler who's just kind of stuck there on the bottom. I can't do anything like the tortoise example that we made up earlier. And when you do look at him, power takedowns. I do like his top pressure. I like his top game. I like his submission defense. I like that Daniel Gracie kind of gym that he's coming out of with all sorts of great guys. That Philly area, we get a lot of big Philly fighters coming up in the next couple of weeks. But when you look at Jackson, Sean Brady, fighters that you have up closer to the top of this card, I do like that out of them. So ever so slightly, I have Pat Sabatini, which might sound kind of strange based on the odds and the fan vote. But I do think Damon Jackson poses a very unique challenge. And I think when a guy walks in so herky-jerky, creepy, and slinky, as tall as he is, with two black lines up his spine for a tattoo, I think you got to watch out for that Damon Jackson. That leech, he is a tough out, is You'd he not? You'd cross the street if you saw Damon Jackson walking towards you. You're damn right. That's Slender Man. I, if I saw Damon Jackson and you walking down the street, I'd be like, I better turn and run. These I'm guys are going to get me. Matt, five. big time fight between these two guys coming up this weekend. Both of us going with Philly's own Sabatini to get the win. Let us know who you have please in the comment section down below please see i'm trying to be polite we love the fights coming up this weekend sandhag and sonya dong in the main event keep it locked in with fight night picks we always say let's get into it middleweight banger coming up this weekend set for the small cage the ufc's apex anthony hernandez looking to put his two fight streak on the line make it three against gatineau quebec canada's own power bar mac andre barrio matt this is a great fight this one that's in the fight night picks wheelhouse and for mac andre barrio his last time out he kind of went to Taco Bell looking for that mild sauce and he turned it into Diablo he because did. he was coming off a knockout loss, a very quick knockout loss in under 20 seconds to Chitty, Chitty Bang Bang and Joe Kwan. He was in the co-main event this weekend. Well, he took that loss and then, what, two and a half months later went to fight a knockout striker in Jordan Wright. You might go with Craig. That's Poppycock. Beverly Hills Ninja, knockout striker. If he doesn't knock you out, he gets finished. And so for Jordan Wright in that matchup, I thought, well, geez, this is very volatile. I'll go with Barrio because he's got that complete skill set. But the threat of a knockout loss that quickly getting back into the cage always kind of makes you wonder. And for Barrio, 
Well, he threw and threw and threw and threw and closed the distance. Right went for a defensive submission. Buddy O was able to go with that guillotine. Roll at the end. End up with a submission win. It looked very good. And for Buddy O in the UFC, he started off 0-3. Losing to Andrew Sanchez, Christoph Jaco, and Jun Young Park. And if we're playing MMA math out there, yes, Anthony Hernandez beat Jun Young Park. So Anthony Hernandez wins this weekend. That's how MMA math works. The no contest that Buddy O has is to Oscar Piotta. He beat him pillar to post and looked amazing in that fight. Since that fight, he's had a win over Abu Zaitsar. He's got a win over Dolce Lindjambula, the lost to him Joe Kwani, and the aforementioned win over Jordan Wright. Buddy O, though, it's interesting because since he switched up camps from going to Canada down to Killcliffe FC, he's kind of added the component of striking into the clinch and just made it a little bit better and accentuated into his game. But he will rock him, sock him, and that can get him caught. It definitely can against some of the better strikers in this division. And that's the weird thing about Anthony Hernandez. We talk a lot about his jiu-jitsu, and a lot of that does come off his win over Hidalfo Vieira. Like, when you submit a guy as good as the Black Belt Hunter, you're probably going to be, or you're going to get your own grappling talked about quite a bit. But the thing about Hernandez is, he can crack on the feet quite well and has really good power shots. And he has close range power, too, which is surprising to see from a long, lengthier guy in this weight division. And that's why this fight could be really interesting. I could see us getting a weird like Daniel Cormier Stipe one knockout where it's like a weird in, cl in tight clinch shot and someone just goes down because for Barrio he is going to get into that spot he is going to work the clinch try to wear on the arms of Hernandez because if you can wear him out to where he's not that knockout puncher then okay you've dealt with half of his game plan and you're just going to make sure you're sound defensively on the mat and you're probably going to be able to work your way to a decision and I hate it when you simplify a fight to this effect but this fight more than any on the card comes down to if Barrio can make get somewhat boring and you're right he has added more striking into his game he's not just the solely takedown artist that he formerly once was but still if he uses that wrestling use the top pressure can mix in good volume numbers with his boxing i definitely think he could work his way to a really one-sided like unanimous decision 30 26 type error if we're being honest but the flip side is Hernandez is definitely the more heavy-handed of the two on the feet, and Barrio leaves enough openings in his striking to make you think, wow, if Hernandez can catch him with a big shot, maybe not look for follow-up ground and pound, just jump for a submission, that's a pretty easy way to win if you're him. The weird thing in this matchup is they can both strike, and it's in all, it's in very different ways. When you look exactly. at it from Marc-Andre Barrio, as much as I said he's going to throw with reckless abandon, he's going to kind of throw like a rock'em, sock'em robot, everything's fairly tight, and it's not at a long range. He's using that kind of tight short range to then bait you in a little bit and then he pushes you up against the cage then he clenches exactly. and the uppercuts the knees again i talk about this fight all the time but his fight against the what is it is it the war master the war master was josh burnett the war hammer adam burnett the, out, of, out of adam burnett adam hunter out of fredericton new brunswick all canada where place. we're based i'm all over the place but it's adam hunter like the comedian war i think it's Somewhere around there. Regardless, I believe you, Craig. His win with TKO, he was, of course, Mac Andre Barrio, the middleweight and light heavyweight champ over there. Hernandez was the LFA middleweight champ. He got a win over Barrio's former training partner, Brendan Allen, to win that belt with LFA. But if you look at it for Hernandez in the UFC, it's been a weird mixed bag. He loses to Maluco Marcus Perez, who's no longer with the promotion, gets submitted there. He then submits Jun Young Park. He gets knocked out by Kevin Holland, gets knee to the body, drops, and then ground and pound. He beats Adolfo Vieira, loses one-sidedly in the first round, and then he comes back and looks amazing as it goes on. And then he fought Josh Fram his last time out. And Anthony Hernandez just threw from odd angles. His feet were kind of off place, but he was just kind of like throwing against the taller friend, a former big time fighter with LFA, never won the belt, but you know, never the bridesmaid, always the bride or never the bride, always the bridesmaid. I can't get any of my sayings right today, but my point is Hernandez was kind of all over the place with his long shots trying to land. But out of that, he was able to close the distance and then rinse and repeat with his takedowns. We're going to talk a little bit later on about Bill Algio's fight against Herbert Burns, where he exhausted him to the point where Burns couldn't get up off the mat and then he just couldn't get up off the chair. He was very tired. He was. Hernandez did that same thing to Josh Fremd and completely overwhelmed him with his wrestling. Went for so many slick transitions in that grappling. Looked very good in that fight. I'm just eager to see if he can do the same thing against Badio because I don't think he can employ that game plan against Badio. Oh, himself. I don't either. Badio's someone who will be the same version of himself from round one to round three. Yes, he's going to tire like any normal 
normal human would. But for the most part, the style itself is going to be very similar. And that's why I, I kind of like him as the underdog so in this I. matchup. I like the steadiness of his game, and I really like his ability to uh, get rid of separation between him and his opponent. I think at distance, Hernandez is a dangerous fight for him. He does have that odd power that could catch him from a weird angle, and then, like I said, open up a submission for Hernandez. But if you're just asking me who's going to win more rounds... I think Barrio's the safer pick in that respect. Yeah, you do look at it. I mean, so much control time, so many takedowns. Fernandez's last time out. Good power, nice jab, good leg kicks. Really thunderous leg kicks. And then a little bit of a reset, but all at weird angles. So you look at the odds. Hernandez open, minus 150, minus 175. Buddy O open, plus 130, plus 145 as it stands. We look at the fan vote, Matt, on Topology. It's surprised to us there to you. I've seen a lot of people talking about this fight already, which is fun because I love the fight as much as I love sayings that I can't utter out of my mouth properly but we look at the fan vote i'm gonna say over under 70 percent hernandez i think the fans like him. i think it'll be over i think it's gonna be over now look at that it's slightly over 833 total votes 73 percent hernandez 60 percent by decision 25 percent by submission eight percent by knockout for the 27 percent that have barrio 62 percent by decision 24 percent by knockout the one fight that I like out of Badio, and people might not want to hear this, is the fight that he had against Dolce Linjambula, where he's taken down a couple of times, but he pops right back up, and then he employs his own game. I like that out of Badio. I like the steadiness out of him. That's why I have him in this fight. I like the tight shots, and I like the gas tank. I like Badio here enough, and, and the fact that he's an underdog was a little bit of a surprise to me just before making this video. I thought he'd actually be the favorite. Well, Hernandez has the better chance of winning this by stoppage, without a doubt. Again, I like his jiu-jitsu for finishing uh, sake, I'll say that. And I like his striking more for his power, but the consistency of Barrio is really hard to pick against in this fight. Hernandez has relied on his opponents to gas out at a certain point in their fights before he really takes over. That's a pretty hard game plan to have. You're fighting a guy like Barrio who can keep a very steady pace from one minute to 15 15, so I do agree with you. I like the underdog. Marc-Andre Barrio coming from the side of the river that has the Museum of National History. And if you go to the other side of the river, you have the War Museum across an Ottawa map. Both of us going with Gatineau, Quebec, Canada's own power bar. Marc-Andre Barrio to get the win. A c'est le but. Let's see if he can do it. Big time fight coming up this weekend. Let us know in the comments section if we were wrong. Because you will. We have a big time main event between Corey Sandhagen and Song Dong that you're not going to want to miss. So keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say let's get into it like that old stain song it's been a while since we've seen the bulldozer tanner bozer in the ufc's octagon and likewise for zay colmea rodrigo nascimento the same thing can be said and under weird circumstances because for the bulldozer bozer out of alberta he gets a finish win over vince st Prue, former title challenger and then he takes a year and two months away. And he's had fights booked in the interim. And it's been unfortunate that those ones have fallen out. He had one against Sergei Pavlovich. You have to think with a win there, you're in the rankings. Like Pavlovich beat Derek Lewis not that long ago. And kind of cut from the same cloth. He was supposed to take on Alexander Romanov. And that fight fell out on short notice. In steps Chase Sherman and then loses. And Romanov was like a minus 1,200 favorite in that matchup. But for Bozer, it's been an interesting run in the OC because it felt like he was signed very late in his career. He had a lot of experience. ACA, yeah, United, which is, or sorry, Unified, which is the promotion out west in canada and very very much was known on him there was a lot of tape to see and he hasn't really changed a whole lot from beginning of his career to what we have in the ufc he's going to employ a volume striking game he has a lot of power in his right hand when he decides to mix his power shots with his volume shots he throws a lot of leg kicks he's an active heavyweight when he's in that cage just he hasn't been active in the last year and for zay Mea, i gotta say this nothing has to suck more than when the athletic commission says you know what we're taking that win away from you that you had over a Lombardo by finish. We're going to call it a no contest because he tested positive for Ritalinic acid. But then he went back. He challenged it. He won the challenge. But the win that he had is still considered a no contest. And that's pretty weak, I, I have to say. It should be a win on his record. I agree 100%. I think you saw it as somewhat crooked. I, I, you hate to see it, Matt. You hate to see it. And that's, that's kind of my kind of jumping off point. I... It was USADA, not the Athletic Commission, but yeah, USADA, UFC, they got to work together to get that one to be a win because for Nascimento, that was a performance of the night bonus winner. He yeah. was getting beat pillar to post in the first round by Alain Badeau. And if you don't believe me, go back and watch the fight. Badeau actually looked really good with his kickboxing in the first round. Nascimento comes back, drops him, finishes him. Nascimento, 
Not really a power puncher. He's a submission artist. That's his game. He very much does get it done on the mat. This is the weird thing about Tanner Bowser. The heavyweight division is filled with specialists. Like, everybody specializes in one thing, and they're, they're just sort of that archetype, if you will, of a heavyweight. Tanner Bowser's a really good version of a well-rounded heavyweight. It's just well-rounded heavyweights rarely make it up to the top of the division, and that is the weird thing about Bowser. Normally, you have people like, think of Stipe, for instance, a great boxer with incredible hand speed, great power. Francis Ngannou might be the most heavy-handed puncher we've ever seen in mixed martial arts. Alistair Overeem, Fabrice Overdoom, like, the names go on and on. For the most part in the heavyweight division, if you specialize in one thing, it can take you very far. But that's been interesting to see out of Tanner Bowser's, uh, at least, rise up until this point. He is well-rounded, but that's the weird thing about his game. Like, even go back to the Arlovsky fight, and I know Arlovsky's way past it, and that was a really close fight. Like, I don't care who you had it for. Tanner Bowser, you would think, though, would be able to at least just land more consistently on a guy like Andre Arlovsky, who, yes, has good footwork at this stage of his career, but still, Bowser being that well-rounded volume striker is one of the few heavyweights whose style is almost tailored towards beating a guy like that and honestly kind of looking good against someone like that. Now, Bowser was able to look really good his last time out against Dovin St. Preux, but even against St. Preux, there's a bit of a red flag you can throw up. Well, that's a former 205 or doesn't look great in the heavyweight division. It's for Bowser, it is really unfortunate that we weren't able to see him in those two matchups that you had talked about. I want to talk about the Pavlovich fight and the uh, Romanov fights as well, because those were going to be real tests for Tanner Bowser. Those were going to tell us, okay, can you beat the other hyped up prospect who is a specialist, like I had mentioned in Romanov? Same thing with Pavlovich, we know how great of a power puncher he is now. Could he go out there and beat those specialists who we actually think very highly of? It's just been really unfortunate for Bowser that he hasn't had those two opportunities, because like you said, if he beats Pavlovich, it's like what I said about Song Yudong, if he beats Corey Sandhagen, you shave two years years off his career and it fast tracks him up. If Bowser was able to fight Pavlovich, I'm not saying he was going to win that fight. That's a really tough fight for him if we are being honest, but still, if you are able to win that, well, then you're a, a ranked 12th to 1 heavyweight. You're going to get big opportunities. You're probably going to fight a big-name fighter on his way out. Like, it just really has been unfortunate for Bozo these past couple of years. And for Nascimento, I went back and watched the video that we had done when he was going to fight Chris Dacus, and Matt's hot take in that video was, I don't see how Rodrigo Nascimento loses this fight. The fact that the all of the grappling kind of goes to Nascimento and the striking sort of 50-50, it gives away my prediction right now, but I don't know how Rodrigo Nascimento loses this fight. I didn't either. We both had Nascimento in that fight because for Nascimento he could strike to get you down and his jiu-jitsu was lights out I mean he submitted Dante Mays in his debut that was impressive he got a quick win on Dana White's contender series to then get him into the UFC he does of course end up losing to Chris Dawkins gets dropped bang bang a couple of times and it's over and then he fights against Alain Badeau and it's like well Alain doesn't want to fight in so many years and he's not very good and Badeau looked really good with the strike in the first round, and then Nascimento looked really good in the second round as Badeau had kind of fallen off in the second round, and Nascimento looked good. So for Nascimento, he's been a long-time American top team guy. You see who he's training with to get ready for this one, and it's Saeed Salma, who's a heavyweight with Bellator that I've mentioned quite a bit. The other thing for Bozer to kind of fill in the gaps, you talked about his loss to Arlovsky. First time I saw it, I thought Bozer won the fight. A lot of people thought Bozer won the fight. He landed more strikes. Then when I watched it over again, those... Kind of longer shots from Arlovsky, got a big reaction out of Bozer, and maybe he did win that fight. So it's it's neither here nor there. But then you look at his next fight. For Bozer, he takes on Alir Latifi, loses by split decision, did a good job when it was standing. Kind of wrestled a lot. Had a hard time wrestling. So we're going to see if Nascimento can land those power shots, can kind of implement his grappling and win out in a fight like that. Because for Nascimento, when he wins, he finishes the fight. And for Bozer... Can he bring Nascimento into the deep waters? Can he land some of those power shots like we saw against Felipe Lins or, or some of the other fights that we've seen? Or can he employ a volume striking game, keep Nascimento off him? That's what we're going to find out. When we look at the odds, Bowser are open to minus 220 favorite, minus 185 right now. Nascimento opened at a plus 185, plus 155 or thereabouts. We have a look at the topology votes, Matt. Nascimento has been out for a while. His stat line says a loss and a no contest. Uh, the fans He's like Tanner Bowser. I'm going to say for Tanner Bozer, it's going to be over under 75%. I think it'll be under, but it'll be the favorite. And it's going to be over here. 866 total votes, 83% Bozer, 23% by decision, 71% by knockout. Can I throw a red flag up just by all the people who picked him by knockout? Up until his recent streak, Tanner Bozer was not known as some big knockout artist by any means. For the 17% that have Nascimento, not surprised, 25% say by decision, or sorry, 24%, 31% by submission, 32% by knockout. I would think Nascimento wins, he gets a finish. For Tanner Bozer, decision, maybe by knockout. Just because... 
of how much Nascimento struggled oh, in that right. first round treading water against Bundo. I'm not trying to discredit anybody who picks Bozer by knockout. I just feel like there's been a lot of people who think, oh, well, he's got some knockouts lately. If you go back and watch a lot of Tanner Bozer, he's not traditionally a knockout artist by any means. He is very much more volume over knockout power. The thing is, if you have poor uh, striking defense, those volume numbers add up, which then make them power shots. He's a 250-pound guy. If they land, they're going to hurt you. So yeah, 240 is last time. 240, exactly. My point is, he's very big, and if a big person hits you 50-plus times, they're going to have effect. And that's the thing about Bozer. I like him because he's not a knockout artist. I know that's a weird thing to say, but that was that's what makes him unique in this division. And I do think he'll be able to use his volume numbers a lot in this fight. And that's why I do like Tanner Bozer in this matchup. But it will be interesting to see him in there against another borderline ranked guy. Because you're right, struggled a lot with the wrestling of Alila Latifi. And the weird thing about the heavyweight division is, there's not a lot of wrestlers at the bottom of the top 15. Then you run into a bunch of them at the top 15. So for Bozer, it would be nice to see him in there with another grapple heavy fighter before he gets like a Curtis Blades, of course, the most grapple heavy fighter. Just really interesting to see where either one of these fighters go after Would this you one. be surprised if Nascimento won this fight, though? No, I would not. I really do think that the pace of Nascimento, it's not that it falls off a cliff. It's not that it gets better. He is a steady fighter himself, and I could see some of his own power shots getting to Tanner Bozer. Maybe as the fight does continue, if Bozer's not able to land with a lot of accuracy, I just think it's going to take a while for Nascimento to really kick into his second and third gear, and I think before that happens, happens, that's when Bozer's going to be able to get good work done. We'll see if we get the Nascimento that had a slick fade and some facial hair rather than the guy that we had our last time out who had a shaved head and a goatee. Looks like he aged 15 years between those, but both of us going with Canada's Tanner Bozer. I like the steadiness out of him, and I'll go with steadiness in this one over the finish ability of Nascimento, which is nothing we ever say on this channel. So both of us with Canada's Tanner Bozer to get the win. It seems weird that we're picking Canadians on this card, Times, Matt, but that's the way do. that we're going with it. We have some big-time fights left on this card, including Chidi and Joe Kawani and Gregory Rodriguez. And in the main event, Sung Yidong taking on Corey Sandhagen. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks, we always say. Let's get into it. Money bags, Joe Pfeiffer saved Dana White's Contender Series week number one by getting a finish over the LFA middleweight champ, Ozzy Diaz. And a few days later in that week, you spring forward to UFC 277, the broadcast features Joe Pfeiffer. B, Joe Pfeiffer is the t-shirt slogan. And if you look at it on that card and on that night when Amanda Nunes won her belt back from Juliana Pena, the UFC announced that body bags, Joe Pfeiffer, would be taking on Italy and North Macedonia's own Alan Amadovsky. And there was a collective sound of, huh? What? That's weird. What, what are we doing here? Because for Joe Pfeiffer, we realized that his last loss was to Dustin Streisfuss, the guy who was sent to the Shadow Realm by Elbus Magomedov not that long ago. But if you look at it for Pfeiffer, great wrestling, power in his hands, good low kicks, decent jab. Matt was really high on him going into week one of Dana White's Contender Series for him to get that win over Diaz. But it just seems like a little bit of an odd matchup considering Alan Amadovsky's last win was back in 2018. In the UFC, he has lost and lost and lost again. He had taken years away between his fights. And if you look at those losses, lose to Christoph Jaco by a decision. A very lopsided decision where Amadovsky's power punching did nothing to the outside work of Christoph Jaco. He lost big time in that one. Got knocked out by John Phillips and they just decided to brawl for like 20 seconds. And who fell first? Alan Amadovsky, and then his last time out against Joseph Holmes, he tried to brawl again after training at Extreme Couture for a very long time. Holmes drops him, and then he kind of gets back up, drops a little bit down, Holmes gets the back, and he had a no-hook rear naked choke off to the side where Holmes was in a bad position against the cage, and he just kind of pulled and yanked on that choke and got it against Alan Amadovsky. So Matt, I'm going to ask you an uncomfortable question. I'm not trying to be a gotcha guy in this one. I Trust me, I'm not. You're really high on Joe, Joe Pfeiffer going into Dana White's Contender Series. You picked Amadovsky to beat Joseph Holmes his last time out. What did you like to see out of Amadovsky versus Holmes that he could use against Pfeiffer in a matchup like this? I don't think Joseph Holmes would beat Joseph Pfeiffer if they lost. That's what the, I really based this on. I think Pfeiffer is... Again, I had a decent level of confidence in him going into Contender Series because he reminds me of one of my favorite basketball players ever, Tim Duncan. What's Tim Duncan great at? The fundamentals. There's something to be said for someone who can go out there and not need a flashy style, not need a lot of spinning techniques or massive takedowns above their head to really go out there and work a really nice style. And that's what I like out of Joe Piper. It is. It's basic boxing combinations. It's a decent level of power shots, don't get me wrong. But for the most part, like I said, nothing's all that flashy. It is just very effective. 
And for Amadovsky, I thought the brawling would finally win out in his last fight. I thought finally they had given him a level of competition to where, okay, maybe he could land that power shot early. But now they're giving him a guy in Piper who can play that brawling game if he wants to, but he's going to do it in a much more technical manner. He has his own takedown abilities. He can get submissions. I don't know how Amad Amadovsky's own brother, I think, would find it hard to pick him in this fight. It's a weird matchup, like, for Amadon, for Joe Pfeiffer, first things first. Yeah, I do like the combinations. I love the lead left hook when he wants to throw it as a power shot, if he's going to fight from that stance. I, I like the kicks that he throws, a little bit of a reset there. His hands are kind of low, too, so maybe if Amadovsky's able to clip him when he runs in, because that's how Amadovsky fights, and that's how he wins these fights. He walks in throwing hammers. And in the UFC, he's walked out a loser three times. So it's unfortunate It's like for if him. you glued the trigger of a chainsaw shut and just turned it on and put it on the ground. Like, it would just go. That's Amadovsky. He just goes. There's no stopping. It's all gas and no brakes. It, it really is something. I mean, he gets dropped by the knee against Joseph Holmes, and that's how he gets back up to then end up getting finished. It's It's been a multitude of ways. And if you look at it for Piper, I like the wrestling. I like the submission abilities. We talked about Daniel Gracie earlier on. Pat Sabatini, the connection, but for Pfeiffer, Daniel Gracie, Sean Brady was in Pfeiffer's corner when he won out. He said a lot of swear words, but they were all happy and he gets the win and he's at UFC 277. He's a big winner. So most people expect him to win this weekend. Uh, when he lost to Dustin Streisfuss, Nevada State Athletic Commission, nine month suspension due to me metabolitic modulators, metabolite modulators out there. So it is what it is, but for body bags, heavily favored to win this fight. Open to minus 300, minus 430 for Amadovsky. Open plus 250, plus 323. Amadovsky had Chris Curtis in his corners last time out. That's always fun. But again, it's a brawling style of Amadovsky. It's some more technical shots. And, and when he's picking the power is Joe Pfeiffer. But I think for Pfeiffer, the best attribute that he has here that hasn't caused Amadovsky issues in these three fights. Yes, Holmes finished him on the ground with a submission. I think if Pfeiffer went in there and took down Amadovsky, he'd have, oh, a, yeah. he'd have a, an easy path to a victory. No, no, and that's I, how I think he's going to fight this fight. I think a lot of people are going to assume Pfeiffer's going to show up and look for the knockout because they are just familiar with him based on the Contender Series tape. But Pfeiffer does employ a very high-level wrestling game. He has great top control, like we had mentioned. A lot of guys from that gym have great MMA top control. That's the thing. They're not just grapplers. They're good MMA grapplers. That's the thing about Pfeiffer, and I couldn't agree more with you. I really do think that's the part of his game that he's going to go to time after time because because, okay, if he grapple or sorry, if he strikes with Amadowski, it gives Amadowski, well, let's say a 30% chance to win, just land any shot. If Piper just wrestles, it takes that 30 and puts it down to like a two. So uh, for Piper, I really do think that there is that one defined area that he can get a win in. It's going to sound silly, but it's like Hamzat's taking on Kevin Holland on short notice. You think Hamzat's going to strike with Kevin Holland? Better not. Better go in there and grapple. Hamzat went in there. Didn't tap the glove and decided he was going to grapple. We'll see if Pfeiffer employs that game plan. We look at the odds again. As mentioned, Pfeiffer a Huge. big favorite. We have a look at the topology votes, Matt. I'm going to say over under 92% Pfeiffer. But 90 is uh, uh, I'm going to say higher, I guess. Yeah. Oh, look at that. 836 total votes, 94% Pfeiffer, 86% by decision. For the 6% that I have Amadowski, 59% by decision. You got to be kidding me. And 20% by knockout. Vamadovsky wins going to be by knockout. That's how he wins fights. They're all by knockout. He's not going to win a decision against Joe Piper. If it happens, I'm going to look silly. And that's a clip that lives on old takes exposed on Twitter. I think Piper wins. I think he takes the fight to the mat and then employs his game. Yeah, I, I do too. I like Piper scrapping a lot in this matchup. Again, even if he does choose to strike, I still favor him in this fight. It's just that does open up a window for Amadowski to climb through. So I expect Piper to grapple his way to a win. Let us know if you're Chris Curtis trying to use this as rocket fuel for Alan Amadowski because he's on this channel every now and again. Matt, both of us going with Joe Piper to get the win. Big time fights on this main card, including one in this division between Chitty and Joe Guani and Gregory Rodriguez. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's get into it. If you're a fan of sneaky, slinky, featherweights, we have a prelim appetizer for you between Damon Jackson and Pat Sabatini. Sabatini's a little bit more bulked up than that, but if you did like that appetizer and you decide that you want to go ahead with the main course, we have Touchy Feely, Andre Feely, a nickname that my wife absolutely finds disgusting, and he's going to be taking on Senor Perfecto Bill Algio. The craziest part about this fight, Matt, is that Andre Feely debuted at UFC 166, Velasquez versus JDS3, sandwiched between 
Kyoji Horiguchi, he got a win in that fight. And Tony Ferguson, he got a win in that fight. And Andre Feely, of course, also won. And all three of those men won by finish. But for Andre Feely, he's about a year younger than Bill Algio, who debuted years after that. So you know Feely, he's been around with the UFC for a very long time. Nine and eight with a no contest throughout this tenure. The last three fights have been a little bit odd for him because before that, he got a win by split decision over Charles Jourdain. He beat Charles Jourdain that fight for sure. He loses to Bryce Mitchell, which is going to happen. Get, got grounded out there. Daniel Pineda, that fight ended due to an accidental eye poke. And he lost to Joe Anderson Brito by TKO. So I'm going to math right off the hop. And your brain's going to go, well, Bill Algio beat Joe Anderson Brito. And, and Andre Feely lost to him. So Bill Algio wins this fight. Well, that's not so because these guys are very well matched up. Body type wise, very, very close in size. Uh, fight style, very, very close in terms of their fighting styles. They're going to strike. They're long rangey. They can work some on the ground as well. I think this is one of the best matched up fights that's on this card. I'm really looking forward to this one. Andre Feely's a wrestler in disguise and not enough people know about it though. That, that's the one big thing about this matchup that I think most people are overlooking. Yes, Bill Algio and Andre Feely strike in a very similar manner on the feet. They're both weird volume strikers because they'll throw single shots and try to rely on power even though I wouldn't say either one has top tier power by any means. I guess I'd ever so slightly favor Algio with his finishing ability on the feet. But Feely... He moves really well. He throws a lot of combinations, a lot of weird looks, will switch stances. These guys and Alex Caceres could all fight each other to a split decision every other weekend, I think, if I'm being completely honest. But the thing about Feely is, he has shown the ability to go out there and take down fighters, and not just fighters who are primary strikers. I always go back to when he fought Dennis Bermudez, who I know at that point in his career wasn't the same Dennis Bermudez who was like a top six, top seven fighter, but still, Andre Feely went out there and got multiple takedowns on him. And I, I believe he lost that fight by split decision. No, he won that fight sorry but I thought he won that fight handily like the takedowns were more than enough for him to secure that fight for me and I do see him going back and fighting in a very similar game plan to this one too the thing about Algio is he's great at striking on the outside but he can use some of those prodding attacks he has a very strong straight uh, shot down the middle he has good front kicks of course everyone's gonna remember the shot that he hit Ricardo Lamas with in the third round of their fight almost hurts him it was really wild almost hurts him he hurts him but uh, he has him hurt that's all I'll say but that's the problem. When you think about every single Bill Algeo fight, you think about some of the highest of his striking. And I don't know about you, Craig. I think about him with two hands on the ground struggling to get back up as someone's on his hips. Bill Algeo, that's my biggest point. He's been taken down in every single UFC fight and his fight on Dana White's Contender Series back in 2019. It is the biggest thing. It's like, oh, I'm fighting a kickboxer. I'm fighting a Muay Thai artist. Well, I better take him down. Well, everybody knows that in the book's out on Bill Algeo. It was a bestseller in the New York Times. When you look at him... Herbert Burns took him down. Herbert Burns, I don't know how Bill Algeo got out of those grappling exchanges because Burns wow. was in on a triangle, in on an iron bar. I don't know why they gave Bill Algeo a performance bonus in that one because Herbert Burns, I, I didn't watch the fight it's originally. Ortega uh, Rodriguez, I didn't watch it because I had other things going on and then I had to go back and watch that fight. And everybody told me about what happened. But yeah, I, I get Like it was so weird to see a fighter just not stand up on the stand up and then stay on the stool first it was just it was an odd ending to the fight bill algio gets a performance bonus and such is life but when you look at algio my lasting impression is llamas had success with the takedown spike carlisle had success at the start algio had a rally throughout that one uh hikardo hamosh had tons of success with the takedown as a striker he looked like could be we know hamosh has that aspect to his game who does hikardo hamosh train with at team alpha male Andre Feely, Matt. That's the answer. Uh, Joe Anderson Brito had success at the start until his cardio fell off and Herbert Burns' cardio fell off and then Bill Algio was able to win out. So we know how good of a striker Algio is. We know how tricky of a striker Andre Feely is. But for Feely, takedowns against Charles Jourdain, takedowns against Sadiq Youssef, takedown, uh, you know, against, like you said, Bermudez against Michael Johnson. Was it height of the powers, Michael Johnson? No, but it was still Michael Johnson. So Feely definitely has that in his back pocket. It is a really fun fight, and Feely has a lot of bones it's on his record as well. By a lot, he has two, as many as Bill Algio has in his short tenure. But when it does come down to this one, Matt, very well matched in terms of this fight. When we do look at the odds... It's just weird, because if I may... Where does the winner of this go? Like, for Feely, he's already fought and lost to, if we're being honest, a lot of the guys, even in the top 20 range. Because he like has Gary been Rodriguez. So Calvin Cater beat the brakes off him in Calvin Cater's UFC debut on, like, Took a day. too. 
But on a day's notice, he boxed his ears and it was terrible. It's just, my point is, for Alcio and for Casera, or not Casera, see, I'm even mixing them up right now. And for Andre Feely, I feel like they are good fighters, don't get me wrong. It's just, we've already seen their ceiling, so it's hard to figure out what happens next. We thought, coming off of last week, we talked about it, you know, on the live show with the sidekick, Julian Rosa, Kim Dowdu. Who wins? They fight Lerone Murphy. But if they don't make that fight... Whoever wins this fight, Julian Rosa, Lerone Murphy, you can probably okay see that. that one happen. So we do look at the odds. Algio open a minus 160 favorite. The line switched. He's a plus 103 underdog. For Feely, open plus 145. Minus 126 or thereabouts. So Feely versus Nathaniel Wood would be fun. Yeah, and, and Feely did gain quite a bit in terms of those odds. We have a look at the fan vote. It surprised us as it is to you because I don't know where it's going to be. I'm going to say over and under... 60% Algeo? I'll say under. You're going to say under? And it's over 676 total votes, 70% Algeo, 81% by decision for the 30% that I have Feely, 79% by decision. So the odds have switched. Feely's the favorite. But 70% of the fans have Bill Algeo. So where do you stand on this one? I find this a very difficult fight to predict. Not just because the odds are so close and the fighters are very similar themselves. But the thing is, if Andre... Okay, I'm going to have to really break this down. If Andre Feely fights like a wrestler... It is a good path to victory because that is a weakness of Algeo. But Andre Feely himself is not a wrestler. So it's not going to be perfect and it is going to sap his gas tank faster than fighting like Andre Feely would. I know all this sounds weird, but if Andre Feely fights like a volume striker who mixes in his takedowns, he can keep that pace for a very easy three rounds. If he decides, oh, I'm a volume wrestler now, that's when I'm going to start to worry about if Algio can come back as the fight goes on, because we know how good Algio's cardio and sustainability is as fights can continue. So that's an area that I think Feely can have a lot of success in. It just will that sap his own gas tank even worse to make this fight closer as it continues. Ever so slightly, I am going to pick Andre Feely. I think his volume numbers might be a little bit better, so we don't get a finish, and if I do favor his wrestling, then more than likely, I'll say the judges are probably going to favor him just with the top control and maybe a few better volume numbers, but I'm having a really hard time with this fight. I think it'll be a fun one, though, for the fans. I like Algeo with the striking a little bit more than I do with Andre Feely. You talked about the X-Factor, the wrestling, and that is the kryptonite to Bill Algeo's game, and then he has to come back as fights go on. Will Feely's gas tank be able to hold up? We saw Feely in a fight against the... Rangy type of striker and Charles Jordan get knocked down in the first round, rally back and have a good second round, and then arguably win the third round, and he wrestled in the second, and he wrestled a bit in the third. So the game plan's right there, but with Bill Algio, I do like the wrestling aspect of his game, and I like the fact that, again, you touched on it, the fact that this is so well matched, and these two guys do fight in similar manners, and if you look at it, the last couple of fights for Bill Algio, Joe Anderson, Brito, and Herbert Burns, I mean, they are oddball ones, especially that Herbert Burns finish, just the way that it did end due to exhaustion. That's not something that you see very often. But I do like Algio in the matchup like this. We're split on the pick. I've got the underdog, Senior Perfecto. Algio, you're going with Touchy Feely to get the win. Really eager to see everybody's thoughts out there on this one because the odds, our thoughts, and the top Algie votes are kind of all skewed over. all over the place. So we need your help on this one. Comment down below. We'll touch on it quite a bit on question mark kicks. That's two hours before the prelims on Saturday. Tune into that one before the big card. Sandhagen versus Song. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks as we always say. Let's get into it. Lineman would be about this fight. 2013 Chris Davis would be about this fight. 2016 Chris Carter would be about this fight. Mechanical Engineers would also, and it's a bit of a stretch, they'd be about this fight. You know why, Matt? Robocop. Because this fight is about power. All it is is about power. That's all that matters. And when it does come to this matchup, you have Chitty, Chitty Bang Bang and Joe Kwani. Michael C. Williams always used to love to stick it right there when he was fighting with Bellator. Taking on Robocop, Gregory Rodriguez. These two guys have knockout power to the nth degree. And when it comes to Chitty and Joe Kwani, while his brother Anthony kind of really laid the mold out in terms of I'm a striker, not a grappler, Chitty and Joe Kwani's rounded things out a little bit more with his defensive grappling, but he very much is about his striking and his power. And for Gregory Rodriguez, you might go, well, all this guy does is box and bang and throw power shots. He's actually a world championship level grappler. His jiu-jitsu is great. His judo throws are great. We just don't get to see it. And if you watch Gregory Rodriguez in his last fight against, holy smokes, uh, Julian Marquez, Matt, he beat the fuck out of him. Like he dropped him three fucking times and never let his foot off the gas. Do I look impressed? Everybody and their mom predicted him to do that to him. Yes, he looked really good. But the thing was, 
I th- I'm almost certain we both said Gregory Rodriguez is not only going to win that fight, but by stop. Oh, yeah. That's the problem for Gregory Rodriguez. And I really enjoy watching him fight. He is a very crisp boxer. He does have nice power in his hands. He just doesn't fight like how he probably should fight if he wanted to get to the top of the rankings. And the weird thing in saying that is, if he fights like his foundation would suggest, he'd probably have a really easy time with a guy like Chidi and Jokowani. They're polar opposites. He's a great jiu-jitsu ace. Just get it on his legs, take him down, rinse and repeat, easy dub. But the fact that Gregory Rodriguez does showcase a lot more of his striking, a lot more of his boxing, than he probably should, if we're being honest, even though it is very good, don't get me wrong, does leave a world where Chidi and Jokowani has another 20-second finish like he did against Mark andre because for Chidi and Jokowani, he's interesting, and this is where I think he can win and lose the fight. He's one of these pinpoint strikers where he's going to put everything behind his shots. He's going to wait for you to leave an opening where you make a mistake. He's going to capitalize on it to the fullest of effects. If Rodriguez can get him up against the cage, though, and make him really consider, okay, move left, move right, worry about the takedown, worry about headshots, make this a test, not just an MMA fight. I think that's where Gregory Rodriguez can have a lot of success with his own boxing combinations, because even against Marquez, Marquez is a big guy for the weight division. He's a tough guy. We've never seen him finish like that before. Gregory Rodriguez was able to get the middle of the cage and really establish that early against Marquez. And when he was able to move him back and cut the cage off, he was giving him a lot of trouble. Now, and I'll even call myself out, there is a big level uh, or difference in levels of striking between Jitty and Jokowani and Julian Marquez. Julian Marquez is very basic with his boxing. He throws damaging shots, don't get me wrong, but they do not come with nearly as much speed or power as the strikes that Jokowani do. The real question mark is, though, will Rodriguez decide to shoot for any takedowns? Because if he does use our fight this fight like he would a grappler. Just go in there, shoot for takedowns, try to use your jiu-jitsu. It might keep his head out of danger for some of those big power shots of Njo Kawani. On the flip side, though, Rodriguez is going to have to close the range somehow. He really is primarily a puncher in a lot of his fights. He'll throw an inside leg kick every now and then, but it's kind of labored if we're being honest. It's not the best of strikes. Again, his foundation for striking really is the boxing. So if he does go in there trying to work the jab behind somebody who can kick, who can knee, who can throw their own jab, and who is even rangier for the weight class, it's going to be really hard for Gregor Rodriguez to show cl- to showcase those striking skills, even though they've been really good in the UFC up until this point. I mean, put it both ways. Like, Gregory Rodriguez has a two-round fight of the night against Jun Young Park, where they went rock'em, sock'em, robots. He has that crazy win over Julian Marquez, where he went rock'em, sock'em, robots, and Julian Marquez went... And if you look at it for Chidi and Joe Kawani... Lost to Jeremy Kimball where he gets finished on the ground. Jeremy Kimball ended up into the UFC. Lost to John Salter, who is a very good middleweight. Don't get me wrong, but on the ground, he has struggled against some of these very good pressure grapplers that get him to the mat and doesn't really have an answer defensively to a lot of the submission threats. Can't stress it enough. Gregory Rodriguez, when he decided he wanted to grapple against Armin Petrosian, had a lot of success in that fight. Loses that fight based on the speed and precision of shots of Armin Petrosian. See where these things are going right here? So there's a lot of comparables career-wise where you can go with this. Two years ago, Gregory Rodriguez was a stepping stone that Jordan Williams needed to get into the UFC. And Jordan Williams knocked him out in the first round. Who's to say Chidi and Joe Kawani can't do that in this matchup? These are the things that you have to look at when you focus on this fight. Because both guys are power punchers. Both guys possess that from round one to round three. Both guys can go in there and have a firefight. Yeah, it, it could happen. There's X factors to their games. And one... It's the grappling of Gregory Rodriguez if we see it. And two, Chidi and Joe Kwani, pinpoint striking and power. Gregory's lost to that in the past and vice versa. So. I think this is a fight, though, where you're going to look bad no matter what you say. Like, if I oh, yeah. Gregory Rodriguez to make this fight look ugly, use his boxing, mix in a takedown, and win a gritty decision win... Chidi Jokowani is probably going to flying knee him or spinning wheel kick him and knock him out. And if I say Chidi's going to win, Craig Rodriguez is going to make it that really tough, gritty fight that we know he can. But this should be a fun fight. It's just, it very well could be, even though it's closely matched, it might be a one-sided fight by the time we get there. All I'll say is the winner should get somebody like Brad Tavares or Calvin Gastelum. Neither one of those guys have fights and we're getting really, really close to the ranking. So when we do look at the odds here, and Jokowani opened a minus 140 favorite Close to par, minus 105 in Joe Kawani now. Rodriguez open, plus 125, minus 115 or thereabouts. So we have a look at the fan vote. On topology, it's no surprise, to, or it is a surprise to us that it is to you. If it was no surprise, it wouldn't be fun to do this. But m- me saying no, I put the horse ahead of the cart. I have no idea where it's going to be. So I'm going to say over under... Just put it at 50. See, well, okay, I'll put it at 50. Over under 50%. Who so you? Gregor Rodriguez is the favorite right now in the odds, even though it's basically a pick But I do think Chidi and Joe Kawani being more of the knockout artist, having more of a highlight type style, I think he'll be the favorite. 
880 total votes, 60% in Joe Kawani, 84% by knockout for the 33% that have Rodriguez, 21% by submission, 47% by knockout. So the fans think that there's going to be a finish. I think there's going to be a finish too. I would agree with that. So the pick out of this one, it's really, really tough. And like you said, you're going to look stupid either way, right? I almost just said Chitty and Joe Kawani and I was going to pick it with a lot of confidence, but I can't pick it with a lot of confidence. I have Bang Bang to win this fight, but by the hair of my teeth, because I really do think Gregory Rodriguez, if he uses his clinch, if he does try to wear on the arms of a Joe Kawani, can diminish some of that knockout power. And if a Joe Kawani can't knock him out with one shot, has to get into some more elongated exchanges, especially on the feet, that's going to force Gregory Rodriguez to realize, hey, maybe I should stop punching and start going for a takedown and it's going to help him get back into the fight. Ever so slightly, I'm going to pick a Joe Kawani. But again, this is a volatile matchup that could go either way. I look at Gregory Rodriguez, the strength of training partner that he's had here recently at Killcliffe FC. And we talked about one of these guys earlier on in the card, Marc-Andre Barrio, as being a good guy to train with. And you have uh, Yusaku Kinoshita that we saw on Dana White's Contender Series as well. Somebody that, not emulating in Joe Kawani, but working on your game plan to really try and close that gap to making Joe Kawani less of an active striker. And Barrio is the perfect guy. Because he found out the hard way that it's really hard to do that. I just don't think Barrio and Rodriguez are cut from the same cloth at all. Matt, they train with each other. No, no, I understand they train with each other. But Barrio is going to use his striking to immediately try to get into the clinch to then work his grappling. Gregory I Rodriguez, Rodriguez is gonna strike a lot more for striking's sake. That's why I picked him. Gregory Rodriguez has tight boxing. He can close the gap with that. Utilize that great judo and that jujitsu. I think this is the fight where he comes in with a complete skill set and he can comes in with a complete mindset that I can't just strike for strike's sake with Chidi and Joe Kwani. So for me, I like Robocop with that. And Matt, this is one of these rare fights that we threw out there ahead of time and we put it out there in the YouTube community section. So we couldn't figure out where the fan vote was. 51% in the community tab having Joe Kwani, 49% have Robocop. Derek Rivia is saying Robocop's one of my favorite fighters. Love pretending when he's in the cage like Citizen, stand down. And he's whooping ass. Complete coin flip as to who to pick. Chad the UFC dad saying gonna be a great fight. I have Gregory by Grand Pound Round 2. Let's try and find somebody who's got Chitty. Brenster saying Chitty by first round knockout. The one and only saying bang bang by round two TKO. And bananas and grapes with a picture or an emoji of a robo and a picture of a cop car. Matt. Uh, fans are split. We're split on the picks. You let us know in the comments section down below who you have. I have Brazil's Robocop. Matt has Bang Bang. Chitty. Bang Bang. And Joe Kawani. It's going to be a great fight. And really, this sets the table. And whether or not this is the co main event or we end up with Sadiq Yusuf versus somebody, because of course, uh, Giga Chikadze is out of that matchup, we will let you know. So keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, as we always say. Let's get into it. Premier Bantamweights looking to put on an impressive performance in the main event this weekend at the UFC's Apex. We have Corey Sandhagen taking on Song Yadong in a great matchup to get us set up for the next three events. And they're all at the UFC's Apex. As always, one half your host and duo, Craig Allen. Twitter and Instagram, Craig Allen FNP. With me to my left, to your right. Respective socials, Matt Allen FNP. Now, Matt, when it comes to this matchup for Song Yadong, he is on a tidy little three-fight win streak. And if you look at the guys that he's beaten, increasing levels of competition. 8-1-1 since he debuted in the UFC. And for Song Yadong, he made the move to Team Alpha Male at the age of 19. He's only 24 right now. And he's taking on a guy who's coming off of an interim title loss in Corey Sandhagen, whose last time out was against Piotr Jan. Punch Jan's ticket back into another fight with Aljamain Sterling. And unfortunately for Corey Sandhagen, already owned one himself against Aljamain Sterling. But if you look at it for Sandhagen, he got that interim title shot off a split decision loss to one TJ Dillashaw. And it's not often that you go from a loss to a title fight, but he was able to do that there. And that was a controversial split decision loss nonetheless to Dillashaw. But Matt, when we look at this fight... Bonuses abound for both of these guys. Impressive performances. We know this. Both guys, excellent strikers, but they do it in very different ways. And that was the most fun part to go back and watch tape study on these guys. Because I'd say both of these guys have faced strikers that are similar. And both guys have had pretty good results against those guys as well. It's really interesting that Sangi Dog's trying to get on this level that Corey Sandhagen's been at for a while now. Like that Aljamain Sterling loss was a number of years ago at this point. And it's really marked ever since then that Corey Sandhagen's been in the top of the division. And yes, they're not all wins. And I hate disagreeing with close decisions. Listen, judges' jobs are very hard. A lot of fights are really close. I don't think Corey Sandhagen did enough 
to edge it out over TJ Dillashaw, though. Had a knockdown in that fight. I just thought his striking was a little bit more effective as it continued. Even though he did give up the takedown a lot in that matchup. And that was the thing about Sandhagen. He was worried about his takedown defense and even some of his grappling defense. Because if you go back even far enough to his UFC debut in his early run, he would get into very bad positions on the mat. His toughness would somehow be able to work his way out of it. And then he'd be able to put on his pace, put on his damaging shots that would be able to finish his uh, opposition. But I remember when he fought Yuri Alcantara way back in the day. Like, he had him in really bad positions. Had him in one of those triangle arm bars where Yuri's just beating the brakes off Corey Sandhagen. But Sandhagen finds a way to work his way out of that. But like you said, Sungi Dong's not really a wrestler per se. He is a striker just in a very different sense than Corey Sandhagen. Because Sungi Dong's going to use his grappling, or not. He's going to use his hands, use his boxing, and his lightning fast hands. And if I had to give Sungi Dong any outlier or any X factor for his skill set, it would be the hand speed that he has for this weight division. And that's a wild thing to say in the Bantamweight division where there's a lot of great boxers and a lot of great fighters with their hands. But Sungi Dong's ability to close the range with his feet and with his jabs and combinations is really unlike many other fighters in the division. And when you watch Sung Yadong, one thing that he does that you don't necessarily see all that often in very young fighters is it's cutting the cage and finding his angles and creating his own angles. You look at the finish that he has over Marlon Moraes, he throws an overhand right, a shovel left, and then a right uppercut that ends up dropping him. You watch his fight against Julio Arce, it's the head kick to then punch and drops him, and that's pretty much it with the follow-up. But you look at this matchup, Sung Yadong, boxing combinations, does not throw very many kicks. And if he does, he'll throw about... It's always less than 10 in the first round, and then it starts to teeter off as the fight goes on. Now, it opens up his boxing a little bit, and then usually the tide's able to take over. His boxing wins out. The guy's 8-1-1 in the UFC. You look at it in terms of the wrestling, struggle a little bit in some of those exchanges with Stamen, but that's going to happen. It's, it's Stamen. And that was another one of those weird fights we talked about while, uh, another one earlier on in the card, where it was okay. Do you like the control of Cody Stamen because he landed zero effective strikes in that fight? Or did you like the few significant strikes Song Yudong was able to land before he would get taken down inevitably in every single round of that fight? And so when looking at all of this, you know, we talk about it. These guys, have they faced, you know, somewhat similar levels of opposition? I think Sandhagen's faced the much harder. He's faced the much harder opposition, but just trying to make the comparables out of it. The two that I had written down, Corey Sandhagen's taken on a compact boxer in Piotr on his last time out, and he took on a very compact boxer in the one championship, now champion, John Lineker in their fight. That was a split decision win for Corey Sandhagen where the UFC went, hey, tough, I understand John Lineker, you're 6-2 and two at Bantamweight in the UFC, you're rated near the top of the division. See you later. John Lineker came this far away from finishing Corey Sandhagen too, guys. He did. And in that matchup, Lineker's just throwing those power shots, those boxing combinations, trying to rip to the body, where Corey Sandhagen, and the craziest part about it, I was thinking in my head, I don't normally listen to a lot of these fights on tape steady with the, the volume on. I, I like to just kind of watch them. I did listen to that one with the volume on. Dominic Cruz is the one that's breaking it down. Do you think Dominic Cruz and Corey Sandhagen are like peas in a pod? Because they, with the footwork, the herky-jerky, the... They're cerebral fighters, and I'll leave it at that. The defense, where they're moving their hands, but that was really it. Corey Sandhagen was, we talked cutting angles, cutting angles on the defensive, not being the tall guy that's leaving his chin up and trying to do the lean back, but leaning back with his hands blocking a lot of those when punches. When he did lean back against Piotr Jan, though, he got caught, because Jan hit him with an overhand left into a spinning back fist. I know that's not a common technique. I know that's not a common combo. That was able to hurt Sandhagen, and that is the one thing I worry about with Sandhagen at this point in his career. We were talking about this earlier on in the day. We were talking about the John Lineker fight. No, no, I, there was a fighter that I compared Corey Sandhagen to earlier in the day from a different weight class. I look at Corey Sandhagen at this weight class a lot like I had looked at Dan Hooker in the lightweight division before Dan Hooker had suffered his recent string of losses to where it was, hey, you're going to be a really hard fight for anybody in the top five. Like, you're going to push them like they've never been pushed before. But I just don't know how Corey Sandhagen and his style, if it's ever going to be enough to get to that title shot. Because we saw against Pierre Gunn, Corey Sandhagen is as good of a pure striker as you can be. But Piotr Jan's just that 5% better with his own natural boxing ability and with his uh, extensive amateur background. I was looking at Sandhagen. He's a lot of damage. He gives a lot of damage. At a certain point, is that damage going to catch up to him? And we'll really find that out this weekend. I mean, of course, you can see that. That's what I went with in the thumbnail. A little bit of a damage. Sandhagen, <laughs> right shot from Song Yudong. I'm telling you this right now. Song Yudong gets into a rhythm against Corey Sandhagen like Piotr Jan was able to in that third or fourth round. I know Song doesn't hit as hard as Piotr Jan does, but if he can start putting together his combinations to the body, to the head, and really make Corey Sandhagen think a lot in this fight, that's where we're going to get one of those fight of the year style fights. And that's what I'm predicting for this above a prediction for either guy. I think this is the fight that we're all going to be talking about 
about at the end of the year when we're filling out our list for fight of the year. When I look at Corey Sandhag and you just try and put yourself into, okay, well, you got to be in recovery mode. You've lost two fights in a row. It doesn't matter how close that TJ Dillashaw fight is. You talked about, does he get into a title shot? He, he had the title shot his last time out. He loses in that fight. His volume stayed consistent as the fight went on, but he couldn't match the power that was coming back the other way from Piotr Jan. When you do look at Sandhag and throws really good kicks, not a part of Song Yudong's game. It really isn't. Again, I touched on it. He throws less than 10 in the first round, and then it starts to go down as those fights were on. But when you look at it for Sandhagen, we talked about this for a couple of other fighters. We talked about it as a net positive for Adrian Yanez. We talked about it as a net positive for Ralphie and Stotts over with Bellator. Look at who Corey Sandhagen's trained with in the past. Got those guys ready for their fights. They got him ready for his fight. When you look at it right now, who's Corey Sandhagen training with, or what can you see out there on Instagram? Because he trains out of Colorado. He's got Carrington Banks, and he's got Ryan Hall. Carrington Banks is a pure wrestler in MMA and a very good one. And Ryan Hall is going to teach you how to get submissions. To me, I think, okay, out of all of this, is it takedowns and submissions? Is that what Corey Sandhagen's going to be searching for in a matchup like this? If that it does, I'm picking Song Yudong. Really? Yeah, yeah, because this is my whole thing about how if Andre Feely fights his fight like a wrestler, it will lead to his downfall more than anything. Corey Sandhagen, you're one of the great pure strikers we've ever seen in the division. Why do something different than what got you to the dance? I understand those uh, trainers are going to help you refine that process. And yes, Song Dong has struggled against pure, pure wrestlers in the past. But Corey Sandhagen in a six-month period cannot make up the difference that a lifetime of wrestling has taught a guy like Cody Stamen. So if Sandhagen does go into this fight thinking, hey, I'm really going to need the takedown, I honestly look at that as a lack of confidence in his own striking. And I don't want that to be the case. He's fighting a guy who's as good on the feet as Song Yudong is. I think Corey Sandhagen's electric on the ground. I think he already has a good ground game. Those are two great guys to get you ready for a matchup like Song Yudong. I think because... he's good. I don't know if electric on the ground is where I'd go. I think he's good on the ground. But the fact that he got controlled so much by TJ Dillashaw was very concerning. TJ's a good MMA grappler. But great. He's... One of the best in this division. That's a bit of a stretch. And he had a blown knee in that fight, too. All I'm saying is, if Corey Sandhagen decides, okay, now I'm something that I haven't been up until this point, I would be a little bit worried. Now, I don't think he is. I think he's using that as a way to help round out his game. But I still think we're seeing a primary strike in Corey Sandhagen in this matchup. I like the keys, or the kick, sorry, not the keys. And I like the check knees of Corey Sandhagen, too. That was something Cowboy Cerrone was able to use a lot against Eddie Alvarez when they fought, when Eddie Alvarez first came over to the UFC. Eddie, a shorter box. Boxer, I guess a taller, rangier kickboxer. You can see the contrast. And Corey Sandhagen, if he does meet Song Yudong with a knee, with an elbow, with some sort of a check attack that prevents Song Yudong from just blatantly rushing in all over, I think uh, Corey Sandhagen is going to really be able to stifle the attack of Song because that's the thing about Song Yudong. When he does get into that rhythm, it is tough to break him out of it. It really is, and especially boxers in this division. You know the bandweight division to be full of fighters that get finishes. We see this time and again every single week we'll throw it on over to you in the youtube community tab through this one out there yesterday 1200 votes 74 percent of you going with Corey sandhagen 26 percent with song yudong through some of these comments matt the wretch saying yudong is really good but i don't think he's ready for someone like sandhagen just yet bill saying sandhagen is always my pick because i've seen him in some terrible positions and fights and he never loses will to win that makes me think of that fight against Mario Bautista where he's starting to eat some really bad shots and then he ends up getting the submission win in that one. Mr. Face, not the popular pick, but I'm going with Song Yadong. Uh, let's see, who else? Doug saying, great fight, but going with Corey. And uh, we have Benjamin saying, I've got Corey for the win. So people kind of split in the comments, but not so much so with those percentages. 74% with Corey Sandhagen. The overall odds on this fight, Sandhagen open minus 160, minus 205 as it stands. Song Yudong open plus 140, plus 165. So the fans have Corey Sandhagen. The voters have Corey Sandhagen. Topology has Corey Sandhagen or about the same percentage. Do you have Corey Sandhagen here? I do, even though this is a very dangerous fight for him. And I'm someone who's really believed in Song Yudong from the go. And I rarely believe in 19-year-olds in the UFC because what, has two worked out for the 50 that haven't? But for Song Yudong, he's always had such a great foundation with his skills and he's got those physical attributes that you just can't teach. He's got great hand speed. He's got great power. Things that you're just sort of born with. And I think this is a great opportunity for Song Yudong to really implant his name into the mind of MMA fans because if you beat a guy like Corey Sandhagen, only great things are going to happen to you in your career. But unless Song can get it into his boxing range, I think there's a lot of other areas that Corey Sandhagen can win moments at. And that's the thing. If this fight does go late, I think that 
that's really where we're going to learn a lot about Song Yudong. Because right now, I know he has good cardio for three rounds. If we get round four and round five of Sandhagen versus Song, A, I've said this many times before, I think this is going to be fight of the night, potentially fight of the year. If we get championship rounds out of these two, this fight's going to be so good. But I do have Corey Sandhagen ever so slightly. And I mean, if you want to go with Song Yudong, a fight that we didn't really talk about all that much, he does have that win over Chito Marlon Vera, who's all the hotness and whose looks change every different time that they put him on it's the television. Wild. Now he's shaved and he's got a bald head, so who knows what he's going to do next. But a great win in the back pocket for Sung Yudong to carry forward in a matchup like this. But again, I do like Corey Sandhagen off of the well-roundedness. You look at Song Yudong where he struggled in some of these fights, the Stamen fight where he struggled with the takedowns, the fight against Kyler Phillips, a longer, rangier, weirder striker, who also has the threat of the takedowns. I'm eager to see if that is a part of Corey Sandhagen's game. For me, I think it might end up being. You disagree with me on that I, one. I just don't like it when a specialist decides to do something that's not their specialty. They can become very good at that, but they're never going to be the thing that got them to this level in the first place. To me, I like that well-rounded aspect, and I like some of those submissions that Sandhagen has had in his past and in his back pocket. In addition, against a lot of these power puncher boxers, Piotr Jan was able to have success. Song Yudong could as well. In that fight against John Lineker, as close as it was, and you had brought it up, I just did really like the movement of Sandhagen, and I like the fact that from round one to round five, Sandhagen's in there for a fight. So for me, going with Corey Sandhagen, you also have the fighter out of Colorado in this matchup. Let us know. In the comments, who you have in this fight, Saturday night, Matt. What happens two hours before the prelims start? We have a show called Question Mark Kicks. We like the kicks so much. It's just a chance for us to go through the card one last time. If there was any weight miss, any concerning weight makes potentially, just gives us a chance to go through them, talk about the fights one last time before they happen. 14 total fights as we're broken down here, but there could end up being a fight for Sadiq Youssef. As soon as it happens, we will update it if it does happen. So you're going to want to keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, as we always say. Let's, let's get, get in. Do it.